your old house. Okay, are you ready? Sure. Yes. Okay, so we're calling the meeting to order uh, February 27th. Roll call. Ms. Snell? Here. Ms. Matoyer? Here. Ms. Fleur? Here. Mr. Davenport? Here. Ms. Franco? Here. Ms. Black? Yes. Ms. Yelsey? Here. Dr. Navarro? Yes, here. Okay, and seeing no cards, cards. we're going into anything. close. Excuse For me. audience? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yes. I could do that. Okay. Uh, I'm calling the meeting to order, um, February 27th, and I have a readout, um, a report of this. Okay, in closed session, the Board of Education took action to approve the resignation agreement and general release for number 201801HR. The roll call vote was was as follows: I seven knows zero. Okay, there you go. Um, and now we will have the opening ceremonies. Um, do you want to, I can't see your name tag, I'm sorry. <laughs> Max, would you like to lead the Pledge of Allegiance? And then first we'll have a moment of reflection. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so adoption of agenda. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, adoption of the minutes from so February thirteenth, two thousand eighteen. So moved. Second. I abstain. Okay, we have an abstention. And um, any discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, okay. Um, next is the recognition two thousand seventeen eighteen teacher of the year recipients. And that goes to you. It goes to me so that okay. I may introduce Dr. Dowdy, okay. who's going to come up and present the Teachers of the Year. Thank you, Dr. Dowdy. So good evening, President Snell, members of the board, Dr. Navarro, members of the cabinet, and members of the community that are with us tonight. Uh, the Newport Mesa Federation of Teachers is honored to be part of the Teacher of the Year uh, program for this district. And we have fabulous and amazing educators throughout the district in all areas that we operate. Um, however, our Teacher of the Year program is coordinated very closely to what happens at the state and the county level. So it's a Teacher of the Year program. We are exploring other avenues and we've had Counselors of the Year and Nurses of the Year. However, this specifically is for the Teacher of the Year program. And so um, uh, NMFT has a process by which uh, persons can nominate themselves or any a member of the community can nominate outstanding educators for this honor. Um, and then NMFT has a committee made up of individuals who are part of our officers uh, or who are past Teachers of the Year members or uh, some of our retired educators. Uh, and so collectively, we come up with a list of uh, 10 candidates and then visit their classrooms, uh, see how they interact with students. We do interviews with them and then uh, come up with uh, to exemplary educators that we forward on to the county program. Uh, and so the two teachers of the year that we're recognizing are Amy Tupa from Ensign. Yay, Amy. <laughs> and, and also Karen Brazenly from Lincoln. So. So firstly, we'll ask Amy to come forward, and uh, Amy, if you have some friends or family that you want to acknowledge, and there are a lot of uh, amazing instant persons here as well. <laughs> so if you could come on down, Amy, and I believe Mrs. Black has something that she might want to say. Amy, on behalf of the board and the entire district, we're so excited for you and like to congratulate you. 
Thank you so yeah, much. The work well done, and we are so glad you were with our students. Thank you so day. much. We're Thank really you so much. And Mike, do you want to come up as well? And so now, Karen, if uh, you could come forward with your family. So at the school's foundation dinner, we did present our uh, Teachers of the Year with a special plaque. And Karen, we uh, prepared yours, and we have it to present to you again. <laughs> Do you want to make any introductions here, or um, we just, yeah, or, it's just up to you? <laughs> my family and my principal. <laughs> I'd have known I was getting my Come picture and I got dressed up. So we, we've said this before, but we are very humbled to be around these fine educators. They inspire all of us to do uh, uh, an amazing job. And so we want to thank Amy and, and Karen and for their staff that they work with on a daily basis and their, the leadership at their schools to help inspire all of us to be better educators working with kids. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brett. Thank you. Okay, on to student board member reports, and we'll start with Max. Good evening. Oh, good evening, everyone. I'm Max Johnson from Corona Del Mar High School. So um, over the break, we had a few different programs le um, go out. We had our Academy of Global Studies uh, visit Russia and Sweden, and we also had the Youth and Government program um, have their final trip to Sacramento. And personally, I'm a part of that program, and it was a great trip where we had a lot of our members uh, have higher positions in the program, so it was really great to see. We also, um, and all of our CIF girls teams, including basketball, soccer, and water polo, all made it to second round of CDM, uh, CIF, so we're really proud of them. And tomorrow, we have a rare disease day where we're um, like supporting, <laughs> no. like just, no, any type of rare disease like that anyone has on our campus, we're supporting, and we're wearing jeans uh, for that, for tomorrow. And finally, our winter formal is this Saturday, so that'll be fun. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Alexandra. Good evening, President Snell. Um, board trustees, Dr. Navarro, members of the cabinet, and distinguished guests. An academic update was um, last week we had 15-hour students made up of sophomores, juniors, and seniors take part in a three-day retreat for SOI's leadership camp. Mm. Um, we would like to thank SOI for affording this opportunity, our students, in gaining valuable leadership skills. And through the camp, we were also joined by Estancia, Costa Mesa, and Newport uh, Harbor students. And it was really fun. I got to go on the trip, so it was a really great experience. And I got to enjoy meeting new people. Also, school for us resumed last week, Wednesday. And this past Friday, we were fortunate to have five World War II veterans come onto their campus and speak to our world history and U.S. history classes. That day was, uh, the day was a part of ongoing living history program. Last Friday was also our first 
of our two future ECHS students shadow days, where current eighth grade Eighth graders in our district had the chance to be guided by a freshman or a sophomore in ASB for the day in order to experience ECHS firsthand. This was followed by a parent, um, Dr. Martinez actually conducting a tour for the parents. And the next future shadow day is, uh, is scheduled for April 20th. And I heard it was lots of fun and a bunch of the shadows got to play a bunch of games with a bunch of our ASB members. Unfortunately, I got to miss that, but I heard it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Tomorrow is our Wahoo's Tacos look, um, fundraiser. It's located in Placentia Avenue, not the one on Baker, but the one across Alejandro's. So um, we'll be hosting our next meal there. You can also download our flyers online on our website and bring them to Wahoo's anytime during the day and we'll receive 20% back on our bill. This Friday is a busy day for us too. We will be holding our annual Red Cross blood drive in our NPR throughout the day. Later that night, our Make-A-Wish Club is also hosting a movie night for our students and families, and I think the movie is Coco. Oh. So I'm really excited because I'm actually going to go to that. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, we're excited to have the Youth Employment Service Program on our campus March 2nd, 9th, and the 16th. It will be held at 8 a.m. Workshops for our students in all grades to help develop their skills, becoming more career ready. This program was conducted last October at our school and was successful for our students who participated. By the end of the school year, we're looking to have close to 20% of our student body have gone through this program either last fall or spring. Thank Great. you. Great, thank you. Good evening, my name is Erin Nguyen and I'm from Costa Mesa High School. Through our project Lead the Way classes, we are excited to participate in our first Solar Cup this May, where our mm. solar boat will make its debut. Our student of the quarter lunch is this week, and students are selected by the letter like MESA, and then this quarter is E, and E stands for Engage Respectfully. We wrapped up our winter sports season with a great CIF effort from our boys basketball team who advanced to the second round before break. The Coast Mesa Drama Department is proud to present Bring It On, the musical opening this Friday night. It is running this weekend and next weekend. We would love to see all of you guys there. The show begins at 7 a.m., 7 p.m., I'm so sorry, on Fridays, <laughs> Saturdays, and 2 p.m. on Sundays. Thank you. Wonderful, thank <laughs> you. Hello. I'm Jalen, I'm from Newport Harbor High School. So yesterday was our first day back and we had our student of the semester breakfast before school. Our girls water polo team won CIF four to three in the last .3 seconds of the game on Saturday. <laughs> Over President's Week, our field studies program had fun in Yosemite. Our choir had an amazing time performing at Carnegie Hall in New York. Our surf team caught some waves in Nicaragua and our youth and government program was in Sacramento. Um, and then finally, our culinary program won first place at their Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America spring meeting three days ago. Wow, Thanks. Good. Mm -hmm. wow. congratulations. Yeah. 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 Okay, and now we're going to have the Harbor Council PTA with Cynthia Strassman. Welcome, good Thank to see Thank you. you, it's a pleasure being here representing Harbor Council. So good evening, President Snell, Dr. Navarro, our board members, our cabinet and community members. I do have a couple brief updates for tonight that I'd like to share with y'all, uh, starting with our Reflections Art Program and the progression. Um, as you know, there are different layers of judge, judging in this program, starting with the school, the council, the district, the state, and then the national. Fourth District PTA just concluded its uh, Reflections program, and I'm pleased to announce that of our 25 Newport Mesa students that advanced to the district round, nine had received awards. Wow. So that's very impressive. Of those nine students, two um, did receive awards of excellence, um, and they will be advancing to the California state level of consideration, which is going to be taking place between now and April. Um, and at the state level, how um, that level works is the winners will be announced at the state convention and this year the convention will be hosted in Ontario in April. So our two uh, first place winners I'm happy to announce are Ian Turner, he is with CDM High School 
and um, he submitted a film production piece. And the second artist is Zaire Zuber, and he is representing Adams Elementary, the special artist category for film production. So we're really wow. excited for those artists. Um, uh, Sherry um, informed me tonight that you all will be honoring the first and second place uh, winners of the district round um, at the March 27th board meeting. So we're excited to be part of that celebration uh, with them. Um, also, I wanted to give perspective um, to all who are in attendance about the level of participation with this arts program. Um, I was a little wowed by, I like numbers, numbers speak to me, and they're, right, you take a look at last year and this year, and kind of, hopefully there's been some growth, and I'm happy to report there has been growth in participation. Um, our Fort District PTA is the largest district PTA in the state of California, so that means that we have, um, you know, a large number of PTA units in um, our district. What that equates to is 275 PTA units participated, that equates to 10,000 entries this campaign. Oh my gosh. So 10,000 students entered um, pieces with this uh, Within Reach uh, Reflections program this year. So within our own council, um, and looking at the numbers from last year to this year, we increased by 27%. We had 17 units participate versus 13, and we had 464 students last year participate with 600 this year. So it, it is growing, and uh, with encouragement and support of the units, we're hoping to um, build upon that for next year. Um, last, um, with regards to reflections, the new um, theme has been uh, released, and it's um, the Heroes Among Us. Mm. So we're excited about that. Uh, next, I wanted to talk to you about is Sacramento Safari. Sacramento Safari is um, a program that's actually organized by Fort District PTA, their advocacy team. And it's a two-day um, advocacy leadership development um, trip that takes place at our state capitol. And it's actually wrapping up this evening. It takes place yesterday and today. We have four council executive board members that are representing our council there, Vicki Waldo, Lisa Bowler, Suzanne Gauntlet, and Noelle um, Kruger uh, from Estancia, no, Early College. Um, and the goal, of, you know, as you know, we're an advocacy program, so part of the goal of this um, advocacy trip is to help develop advocacy leadership skills. So for those who are interested, they're voted in by their membership to attend the safari. Um, they attend a training, and then they go and they participate. Um, there are key speakers that come and speak to the attendees about issues related to children and uh, youth and families. And in addition, they get um, kind of a you know, a first-hand knowledge of how our state government works. And additionally, on the second day of this, um, this program, they actually have a chance to advocate and meet with legislators in their districts. So I had a chance to go last year. It's very engaging. I was empowered. I felt like, you know, I have a better perspective and a better understanding and appreciation. It makes me want to continue my role in the PTA and advocating for children. So uh, we have a meeting coming up this Monday, so we're looking forward to feedback from our council team that attended. Okay, next, um, I wanted to talk to you about ED100. Uh, the California State PTA has partnered with ED100. It's an online organization um, that uh, has a goal of educating the parents and the community about um, the education system in California. Um, it's nonpartisan, um, non-jargon. Um, it provides online program and lessons for those who are interested, who want to be more informed about the education process. They do have um, a local control funding formula uh, aspect to that and um, LCAP. Um, it's offered in English and in Spanish. It's free. And um, you, can, you don't have to, to finish all the lessons in order. You can jump and pick and choose which topics you'd like to go to. Um, so we wanted to share that resource uh, with you all. If you're interested, please visit www.ed100.org. We will have this link on our Harbor Council website. In addition, we will be sharing these uh, with the PTA units on Monday. So it's just a great resource. Mm -hmm. um, I'm almost finished. <laughs> Um, March 21st is our annual Fort District Administrators um, Dinner. This actually is a venue that celebrates our school leaders. Uh, we also announce our Outstanding Administrator Award, Teacher Awards, and Unit and Council Awards. Last but not least, um, with regards to the units, the units are actually 
um, currently filling their executive slates and committee chair positions and will be hosting um, having their um, elections in March and April. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Oh, thank thank you. you very much. And I have to say that Sacramento Safari is, mm -hmm. I, I've probably gone about five times and <laughs> I went last year because you, you do such a great job mm -hmm. of getting great speakers and it's a great educational experience and an opportunity, as you said, to meet with legislators. Mm -hmm. So, but it's always, I remember last year I had to fly in mm -hmm and just rush over here because mm -hmm. it's always seems to be near right. a meeting, but it's very, very, I think, I know that, um, Judy's gone. Judy's yeah. gone like a mm -hmm. yeah. hundred times. times. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's very, it's, it's very good. It's just empowering and too, it's, it's intimidating when you meet with the legislators because you're thinking, who am I? I'm a parent. Yeah. What do I know? Yeah. And so, but they're real. They're just like us. And you Absolutely. sit down and you have a couch, you yeah. know, coffee conversation, and um, it's real. And it it's, is. It's and just perhaps the most interesting piece of it mm -hmm. is the fact that you get to hear from staff members who have been a part of the legislative process mm -hmm. for years. Right. And actually, you learn more from them than you do from many of our, <laughs> not all, but many of our legislators. <laughs> anyway, well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. That's right. That's going to be my job. Oh. Mrs. Floor. Uh, yeah, I just, um, I think, you know, Sacramento Safari, but I'd also like us to look and explore the opportunity that Irvine does. Irvine does a Sacramento Safari, but takes students up. And it's quite you exciting because they take more. a number of their students, um, they train, they meet with many of the individuals that, that Sacramento Safari meets with. So they meet with Bob Blattner, they meet with uh, the head of the Senate committee, um, Rick Pratt, they meet with a, wh a whole gamut, but they also get to meet with with uh, their legislators in their particular district. And they go armed with <laughs> issues that are relevant to our, dis you know, to their district. So um, they take up, you know, they're taking kids up to talk to them about CTE. They're talking about some of the other, class, other issues in, in Irvine. But I think it would be really wonderful because sometimes we are, because of our funding system is so, is different, it would give them a, a good balance and a good indication about, and advocate for our, for our, for our district. And, and nine times ten, the, 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 the legislators absolutely love to listen to and hear from students. So I would, you know, it's a great yes, opportunity. Yeah. Sacramento <laughs> Safari over the years has had a number of school districts that have brought students with them. Yes. Um, I think the year before last, Harbor sent a student along with the student's mm -hmm. parents. So, you know, it, it varies as to the extent of time. But it was, it was the one that I know of is Sharon Wallen, who's on the board at, in Irvine and Sue Kuwabara years ago, they were very involved with PTA, and so they were instrumental in forming it for their own, for their district. And so it's it's similar to Sacramento Safari. So I would love to explore that. Yeah, absolutely. For students. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to go on to our reports, and Dr. Navarro. Yes, thank you. Um, we are going to provide you with a report on how we maintain school safety. So as Dr. Uh, Diaz Dion is coming, coming in, I'm going to give you some background. Um, you know, uh, as an administrator, sometimes, and sometimes as teachers, sometimes uh, we end up uh, having to be stern with students. And more than once on, in, in my experience, uh, people have uh, said, are you an administrator or are you a police officer? <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, we really work in a different uh, legal uh, arena than our police officers. And uh, I think this is why we have a great partnership with our SROs. But we work under the uh, auspices of en loco parentis, which translated to English means in place of parents. So all of our teachers, all of our administrators, all of our counselors, when we're at a campus, it is like we're the parents of all of those kids. And we are acting as any parent would. Um, and so when it comes to school safety, uh, we really, I, I think you uh, see uh, why the teachers in, in, par at par in Parkland acted the way they did. They would have done, they did what they would have done for their own kids. And I think that it's important for our community to understand that's how we approach school safety. We would do, uh, we would act in a manner that we would uh, 
act in if our kids were right there with us. Uh, and and should, there should be no difference. Uh, also, um, um, I wanted to uh, make sure that uh, we have a couple of cards from speakers. I just want to remind our speakers that um, the comment period is to allow you to speak to the board uh, regarding issues within their jurisdiction. And I know that some of our other districts have had comments made about, you know, gun control, arming teachers. Uh, that, those are all state issues and within state jurisdiction, not within our board's jurisdiction. So they're not going to be able to entertain any of those comments <laughs> at all. But that doesn't mean they aren't listening. Uh, and perhaps in their own private uh, life, they may uh, pursue support of those. But as board members, that is not within their jurisdiction. So uh, as if you do come up and make comments, please uh, try to maintain those within the jurisdiction of the board, which is his policy regarding safety and, 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 and uh, security of our students. Um, and uh, the last thing is, I think it's um, important uh, to know that uh, uh, we work, uh, uh, we have a theme that we, that we discussed yesterday in preparation for this presentation uh, that we believe we're stronger uh, in regards to providing safety for our students when we work together as a community. And that community, of course, are the employees, it's our students, it's our families, and uh, our neighbors, our business, our, and our business communities. Um, and that is strengthened by having strong relationships. So tonight, I think what you're gonna hear is how we work together as a community. Dr. Diagostino is gonna provide you with an overall uh, uh, structure of our, of our safety strategies. And then you're gonna hear stories from the field. And so Dr. Diagostino is gonna bring up uh, a couple of principals and SROs, and they're gonna share how this actually works uh, in real life when, when we have to initiate safety procedures. So Dr. Diagostino. Thank you, Dr. Navarro, uh, President Snell, Vice President Matoya, members of the board, cabinet, and members of the public. Thank you so much for giving um, district staff this opportunity. Uh, I, I, in the interest of fair attribution, you know, it does say prepared by student services, but as Dr. Navarro mentioned, um, there's been a lot of people that have been involved in bringing this report to you tonight. There was a large meeting, um, over 12 principals, three school resource officers, assistant principals, directors, assistant superintendents, all led by the superintendent yesterday. Uh, while we were on the, the spring recess, obviously the events in Parkland were, were forefront in our mind and there was already preparations and conversations um, and communications with district staff and among district staff to talk about safety in our district. So again, the, the goal here is really to focus on three central questions. Um, what have we been doing? Uh, what are we doing in light of recent events and, and what are considerations moving forward. Um, you know, this is always a priority for us. It always has been. Um, and as we look at the essential elements of school safety, it really is like a pyramid. There are five elements. Um, and I'm going to spend the remainder of my presentation talking about those five elements. Those are positive school culture, hardware tools and resources, staff training, exercises and drills, and emergency management procedures. This is not the district's unique vision. This is a widely generally accepted um, scaffolded approach to safety and uh, emergency responses. Really what it boils down for us where we believe we are most resilient and where we have our strengths as Dr. Navarro mentioned is in a committed staff, resilient communities, and strong relationships with partner agencies. I do want to share with you that the chief deputy to the state superintendent of public education uh, was in communication with Dr. Navarro last week and she was able to confirm the following, that the district is in fact in compliance with its comprehensive school play safety plan requirements consistent with education codes 32280 to 32289, that we have appropriate procedures for communicating with parents of all of our schools in the district and that our regular school safety drills go beyond the education code requirements by including procedures for lockdown, shelter in place, in addition to the regular earthquake and fire drills. Our threat assessment protocols also exceed the education code requirements. Um, and as you have heard about our crisis response protocols and threat assessments, we'll talk a little bit about more, a little bit more about that tonight. Um, so under positive school culture, I'm just going to um, 
put up here a variety of things that we have underneath this pillar of, of school safety support. A couple of things I want to highlight, obviously our positive behavior intervention systems is a district-wide approach to promoting um, the kind of culture we're looking for to minimize um, those issues that could lead to problems on our campuses. Uh, we have a strong school resource officer program. My, my job yesterday was to take notes um, at the meeting that happened. One of the things that struck me was um, Principal Halt from Estancia High School pointing out how important the school resource officer program is in terms of the relationships that those school resource officers build on campus in addition to the intelligence that they gather and uh, their ability to ferret out issues um, early on. Um, that has been very, very positive. We have a lot of specialized staff, as you can see up there, that are also supportive of school safety uh, in their roles and in their daily duties. Um, we also have partnered with Challenge Success um, that was mentioned at the last board meeting. And I think that's going to also improve the overall culture of the school. One of the strongest things we have in our arsenal to keep our schools safe is to be proactive and to have a pulse on the culture and the community of our students and our families. And I think we're doing that as best we can. And then we also have anti-bullying and um, parent education programs as well. So hardware tools and resources. This includes our relationships with law enforcement, again, our school resource officer program, um, our ability to control access to the campus. Uh, one of the things that, was, uh, that I was made aware of is that by the end of the summer of 2018, all of our, all of our elementary schools will have controlled access onto the campuses. And um, there's a commitment to also move in the secondary school area as well on that. Um, I, our, our public information officer wanted me to make sure that, that we point out about our district and school websites, our email system, our text alerts, our social media presence, um, how we encourage parents to be active participants in our school communities. Um, we have radios for all of our campus safety personnel. We have golf carts that make them mobile to move around the perimeter of campuses. We have a district communication system that is a very robust one in the case of um, district communications to our school sites in emergency operations. We test that yearly. Uh, and I'll be talking about other emergency procedures. <coughs> So staff training and drills. And again, this, my goal here is to kind of go through this process and have you hear uh, people from the field. We have school safety plans. They were updated as recently as last month. Um, as you know, we have safety protocols and procedures for crisis and emergency operations. Um, we do accountability drills and exercises, again, not just for earthquake and for fire, but for lockdowns, shelter in place, et cetera. Um, we have threat and risk assessment protocols, and we also um, meet regularly with SROs and campus safety facilitators. In fact, I, I met with the campus safety facilitators today, this afternoon. We had a regular meeting scheduled, and it was a very robust discussion about um, their passions for wanting to, to keep our campuses safe, and were giving me a lot of good ideas to, um, to bring back to the district level. Um, just as a, as a point of clarification, the, you know, a risk assessment versus a threat assessment, for those that are wondering about that. So when we talk about risk assessments, we're really talking about the risk that is posed by a student to himself or herself or to others, or maybe even a staff member. It's an internal kind of concept. When we talk about a threat, we were probably talking about something that might endanger a campus. We could be talking about something external that could be coming onto the campus. It could be information that we have. And so we have protocols for both of those, um, those events. Procedural safeguards. Um, again, in the, in the whole vein of starting with a pyramid of interventions, if you will, um, you have passed um, quite a while ago, I think, because I remember when I was a teacher, the, the civility policy. I think I was a teacher at Newport Harbor when it got passed. Um, <laughs> And it was in response to uh, disruptive and unruly individuals uh, on a variety of different levels that could bring disruption to the school or harm or whatever. It's an, it's an extremely, that board policy is an extremely effective tool in rooting out inappropriate behavior um, by all kinds of members of, of the community. Um, 
So in the process of a civility or disruption um, policy where we would enact that, it typically involves a letter that comes directly from the principal, or it can come from my office. And we articulate that on this date, you did this, you shouldn't have done that. You, because you did this, it caused this kind of disruption. And if you do it again, um, you're gonna be barred from the campus. Uh, if, if that is either inappropriate, given the context of the circumstances, we can immediately proceed to enacting Penal Code 626. Penal Code 626 allows a school official to bar an individual from the campus immediately for up to 14 days. And that person can't get back onto the campus unless they meet with the superintendent's designee to have a hearing um, on that person's actions. Uh, typically, I, I am the 626 officer that handles those, those kinds of situations. We have also, if we have to ratchet it up, if you will, um, we, we, ha we have employed stay away orders. A stay away order is something that um, can be put together by our attorneys uh, and it is supervised by the courts. Uh, and then in, in some of the most restrictive elements, we also have restraining orders uh, and, and we would go to court um, and we would bar that individual uh, with a judge's uh, direction for up to three years. So, um, you know, again, uh, there's, when we're building relationships, when we're building relationships with the community, when we're building relationships with individuals, um, we, we, can, we can manage safety very well. Uh, but we are prepared. I think the point of this particular slide is we're, we're prepared to do what needs to be done. A, a restraining order is typically a five-figure cost to the district, low to mid five figures. Um, so that is not an insignificant sum of money, but it is an expense that um, you are willing to authorize us to use to maintain the safety of our campuses. Uh, emergency management procedures. Now, this is the top of the pyramid. Um, this is something where um, it rarely happens, but when it does happen, I want you to know we are prepared. We have an emergency operations center here at the district office. Uh, we also have incident command structure um, protocols that we use, which is a part of the statewide emergency incident command system. As you probably know, all of us as public employees are civil servants in any emergency event that is countywide or statewide. But we also have a threat and risk assessment process that's, that we use um, on a regular basis. And I kind of want to go through that very, very quickly with you. So um, if we have an event, we decide whether it's emergent or non-emergent. Is it a suspicious person on campus or is it, a, um, is it something more serious? Uh, and that's, that's obviously done quite immediately. There's communication involving a variety of staff members all the way from the superintendent um, down to our partner agencies. In the case of the San Bernardino shooting, which was something like three years ago, I can't believe it was three years ago, but the San Bernardino shooting was, I think, a textbook response uh, for us as a district. The superintendent was in communication with the chiefs of police of both Costa Mesa and Newport Beach, and directors and assistant superintendents were communicating and fashioning messaging uh, in response for concerns that were coming from the community about that event. We then move to an assessment once we've had that communication and we look at threat level, risk level, are there, is, is there anything external that we need to address, anything internal, uh, any individuals that we need to be concerned about and what resources do we need to bring to bear and then obviously we respond appropriately. Um, we have had, uh, we, we have a variety of these on a regular basis. I'm proud to say that it's systemic it's embedded, it's expected, um, and um, it's pretty, um, down pat is not the right word I'm looking for, but, but, but it's routine for us. In the, it's routine in the sense that we do it quickly and we do it efficiently, but we take every case very seriously. So that's kind of the overview. As Dr. Navarro mentioned, I think it's really important that you hear from perspectives um, you know, out there in the field. and so. We've invited two principals and their school resource officers to speak tonight. The first pair that I'd like to bring up is Cheryl Beck. She's the principal, obviously, at East Bluff Elementary, and her school resource officer, Gary Clementi. He just stepped out. He just stepped, he just stepped out. out. He just stepped out. <laughs> He'll be right back. Okay. Or I can, we can go with Jake and we'll go with Jake. Yeah. So 
So uh, Gary likes a big crowd, so I think he's... <laughs> he's right there. There he is. He's getting a call. Okay. So there's Gary. So we'll go, with, we'll go with Gary and Cheryl right now. Well, good evening, President uh, Snell and members of the board, Dr. Navarro, cabinet, and our community members. It's a pleasure to be up here to share with you what, what a positive um, relationship that Officer Clemente and I have as SOR and principal, the students, the staff, and the parents. So I kind of wanted to give those three perspectives of how um, Gary is a support to the elementary site, even though he's assigned a CDM. So it all starts with the rapport. Um, I'm pleased to say that we call each other, we text, um, he comes by, and um, is very responsive. Um, Gary has a very positive presence on our campus, um, starting with mentoring our students at that tier three on our PBS pyramid, mm -hmm. the very at-risk kiddos. He comes over and mentors, has a stern chat sometimes, and also a positive um, coupon of a lunch that, hey, you change and turn that behavior around, I'm proud of you, so he comes back, and any chance he's there, I'm like, oh, can we talk to these three kiddos again? <laughs> these three are doing great, oh, here's a new new student to mentor, so that's ongoing. Uh, he, also, he also speaks to our students, um, whether it be a certain population and grade level that we need to revisit how to use technology appropriately, or chat and follow up on a second step lesson. Um, and he's also very active in our Red Ribbon Week, uh, speaking to our staff, our community at Flag Deck, and walks to, the, to school with the kids on Walk to School Day. That's a good tradition we have as well. Jogathon, you come and yep. high five all the kids as they go around each time. <laughs> and basically, anytime we can get Gary on campus, um, we love it, and he's a great support. Uh, to our parents, he attends PTA meetings and speaks on technology and safety. And just reminds parents of their parental control of rules and regs at home with cell phones and social media and gives lots of tips on internet safety as well. Um, and then to our staff, uh, he's a huge support with, of course, um, helping us with our safety procedures, whether it be the lockdowns, the protocols, the drills, walking around campus. Um, we're actually doing one, I think it's next month, in a classroom, <coughs> talking about where would be the best scenario place. Well, not best, but given the scenario, what would we do? Um, and then going through tabletop exercises. And I can say, uh, in the past, uh, Vlad Anderson was also very, mirrors what I'm complimenting Gary on. So I don't know if you want to give more details, yeah. but. Well, first off, I want to thank the board for having us. Um, <laughs> I see a lot of familiar faces. I see our PTA members here. Uh, I want to say, uh, give a shout out to uh, Dr. Navarro as well, who was on campus. Uh, as he approached and we had uh, our volunteer mom work in the front desk, I asked Dr. Navarro for his ID. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you know, these are trying times. We need to see your ID. And uh, the mom that was volunteering almost fell out of her chair. And she, said, <laughs> she said, do you know who that is? And I said, I know exactly who that is. Let's see his ID. <laughs> Having said that, um, as Principal Beck, um, kind of echoing what she said, you know, I'm assigned to CDM. I'm assigned to the middle school and the high school. I have an office there. I spend I'm full time there. But I, I look at all of our elementary schools. We have 12 schools in Newport. You know, it's the CDM zone. So I, I look at when I get a text message, and I get a lot from our uh, East Bluff friends or our Anderson, anyone in our zone. I want to know what's going on there. No different than I want to know what's going on at our school. And you know, the kind of same model I apply to CDM. I apply to East Bluff as well. Um, you know, mentoring students, speaking to them about internet safety, they're all going to come to seventh grade. You know, when I speak to the sixth graders, having that chat now saying, hey, listen, we need to be appropriate with our social media. We need to be considerate of other students, what we post online lasts forever. And having that dialogue with them in sixth grade before they come into our seventh grade has been huge and beneficial for me. Um, whether it's the Jogathon, uh, PTA meetings, Flag Deck, which I enjoy. Uh, or just even doing safety protocols and tabletops. I feel like when we all get together and have this conversation with the staff, you know, th there's kind of two ways to look at it. It's that, you know, there's never anything that's ever going to happen in Newport ever, no critical incident, and then there's a, you know, the sky is falling. And I always say that if we could have that kind of dialogue that we're somewhere in between, that's kind of our sweet spot. And uh, whether it's, you know, going with uh, Principal Beck on home visits, working with individual kids and parents on behavioral issues, it's that relationship. Uh, like Dr. Phil said, I think that's what keeps us so successful. And you know, we could say how that Newport we have you know 
patrol officers, we have motor officers in the morning, we have two SROs, but for me it's really that relationship with not only the students, with the staff and the community is kind of our best resource, I think, in being effective. Um, I'm a quotes guy, and this quote kind of sums up what I think. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Grossman is kind of the expert on all things school violence. He writes books on how our, you know, we give our boys uh, video games too early that are too violent, and we desensitize them to violence, and he kind of says it uh, more eloquently than me. He says, every day millions of parents hug millions of kids, their most precious possessions, the most precious things on the face of the earth. They send those kids to school, trusting us to keep them alive. This is the most important thing any society can do to protect our young. And I say that every time I give active shooter or lockdown training, I have the best job in our department, and I feel humbled and blessed to work in our department and, and be a part of a community that values uh, SROs. So I think that that relationship we have, kind of building that relationship and the communication is why we're so successful. Great. Um, can you stay right there for a minute? You want to, uh, Mrs. Matoya? Um, and East Bluff is your example of right. the relationship that you have because I know that the principals have a pretty good um, learning group together. They have a really cohesive group. And Absolutely. so you have relationships with Harborview and Anderson Absolutely. and Coast and Our Lady more than likely Absolutely. because there's a bunch of schools in that zone. Absolutely. So thank you. Okay. That's very Can important. Ms. Mrs. Yelsey? Yeah, I just have a question. I, I know because every meeting I'm at that you're at, you give your phone number, your cell phone number yeah. to any parent I who do. wants to be there. Do the students also have your phone number? They do. Want? They okay. do. I kind of joke. I say that um, I kind of made the joke that, you know, if at, on Friday night at 2 a.m. you text me that there's, uh, there's traffic at CBM, I got that. Um, but <laughs> I could say, and, and uh, um, Principal Beck will uh, attest to, you know, whether it's our staff, whether it's um, our students, I get text messages and phone calls all the time. And 99% of the time, it's kind of a nothing deal. Hey, I want to remain anonymous. Can you look into such and mm -hmm. such? And if we kind of look at it holistically, you know, we do the administrative side, we do the counselor mm -hmm. side, we do the school psychologist side, and potentially the criminal side. Most of the time, it's absolutely nothing. But it, it comes back to that relationship and that trust. If they don't feel that I'm trustworthy, or I'm gonna do what I say I'm gonna do, I'm not gonna get that information. And most of the stuff we do, you know, whether it's at uh, the high school, the elementary, the middle school, is that. And it's usually through a text message or a voicemail or an email. And I think that that's why I always give my number out. And for a while, I used to say it was 8675309. <laughs> and then some people would write it down and kind of give me the look, but <laughs> because you gotta have fun. But I, I think that giving out and just being available to the community has kind of made us so successful. And, and, and I also speak to the fact that, you know, we're always learning, we're always getting better. I don't like the saying we've always done it that way. So if there's ever, and I always tell our PTA, who can attest to this, I always say, if there's something we could do better, let me know. So, and I think we're, you know, progressing and constantly getting better. I have a question, and I and perhaps somebody's going to address this later. So tell me if they are, and that is, what is the procedure if there is? I mean, you showed us, uh, yeah, Dr. Dias. De, de, <laughs> I'm used to calling you Phil. Dr. Diagostino de de told us the communication piece, sure. this and this. But I'm interested more in also. Um, do you, if there's something that occurs on campus, right. how how fast can you get officers there? Well, it, I can, and again, and this is this comes up a lot. Obviously, mm -hmm. at our, we do the at CDM High School. In order to be, we have a lot of volunteers that work at our school, and in order to mm -hmm. be on the volunteer, you have to attend our lockdown safety training. That's the new Ooh. protocol since I've been on for the last three years. Great. And the same thing I tell them, I say that you know I could kind of just look at this from that ten thousand foot perspective. Mm -hmm. I look at it that we have SROs on campus. We're half a mile from a police station where there's helicopters and SWAT teams and dogs. On one side of us is John Wayne where you have Orange County Sheriff. The other side we have Irvine. We have Costa Mesa and we have Huntington. Mm -hmm. So I say that not only do you have an officer on campus, you have multiple officers that are constantly aware of critical infrastructure on our city, which includes our campus. So I'd say that, you know, I, I can't say a specific time. I could just say that Overall, I like our chances better than maybe in a rural setting where mm -hmm. you have a sheriff that takes 45 minutes to get there, right? right. So, and in Newport Beach, as all you could attest to, um, we have a lot of very concerned parents that have cell phones. Mm -hmm. And if anything looks remotely out of place, we get lots of phone calls about it. But that's how we get stuff done. Mm -hmm. um, so I think kind of looking at it that way. So what about a teacher in a classroom? I mean, if something occurs in a teacher's classroom, I'm talking something serious. Right. Um, 
United yeah. Dragons. So all of uh -huh. our phones, mm -hmm. all of our phones, you can dial out 911 oh, okay. from any phone, mm -hmm. uh, any classroom. And that also, we also have a protocol and a procedure where all 911 calls are also routed here to the district in terms of our ability to assess the nature of the emergency. So we can already start while while emergency responders are moving Coming. on uh -huh. the 911 call. We're also mobilizing personnel, crisis response. We can do that almost simultaneously. Okay. And part of our part of our uh, active shooter lockdown training for staff and volunteers mm -hmm. is that are you you know are you capable of making that phone call out of your office, out of your classroom? We wanted them to be familiar. That the joke I always say that ten years ago they used to say something like Mr. Brown is in the building. Whenever there was a critical incident, mm -hmm. we oh. want them to speak in plain English and say it directly to us. And it mm -hmm. always comes up inevitably. Someone says, well, why would you want to um, broadcast that? Because I want to know if somebody's on campus and they shouldn't be, mm -hmm. we want them to know that we know. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, you know, there's a fundamental difference between <coughs> what a lockdown is or what potentially an active shooter is. It could be a deal where we have a police pursuit that ends on East Bluff and Jamboree, mm -hmm. and we potentially have to call a lockdown because we're still trying to get containment on the perimeter, right? So, but right. our school needs to know the difference of when they call in saying, hey, it's a lockdown versus an active shooter. Or, exactly. you know, we've had in the past at Newport Harbor, I always say, and everyone laughs, a swarm of bees came onto campus. Well, mm -hmm. some of the kids are allergic to bees, so they had to call a lockdown. Or if, yeah. you know, yeah. dogs came onto campus from the Coronados, mm -hmm. we need to know about that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So Candy. just kind of having our staff yes. and our admin familiar with those key terms and then having our teachers feel comfortable that they know how to make an outgoing call, they know how to get on a PA and, and kind of coordinate them. So. Are they also trained on the Titan pro? Pro, um, program on the so phones? yes oh. mm -hmm. yes we have mm -hmm. the Titan communication we have blackboard we have uh, texting capability we've got a yeah. district-wide app so there's a lot of ways to get the information out with your permission I'd like to ask um, sure our next pair to come yeah, up absolutely thank, thank you again you. thank you very much and that would be mr. Haley principal of Costa Mesa High School and uh, his school resource officer officer Torres thank you. Uh, good evening, President Snell, uh, members of the board, Dr. Navarro, cabinet, uh, distinguished guests, and our student representatives. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to talk uh, about uh, our relationship uh, with the community of Costa Mesa, uh, as well as be a part of the conversation yesterday with the community of Newport Beach. And as Dr. Navarro said, it really comes down to that sense of community, which keeps us safe. Um, we, we approach that uh, when we're building our, our safety plans, and, and really it's that see something, say something approach, and it, it really comes down to relationships, as Principal Beck mentioned, not only as teachers and principals, but also our school resource officers connecting uh, with our zones to really formulate those relationships so students feel safe to communicate. And so we're not going to repeat all of the things and connections that uh, you heard, but those are happening in our zone as well, um, but really want to say that we're fortunate. Uh, I've been in other sites where there wasn't a school resource officer, uh, where there wasn't that uh, connection to the community, um, where the community and school district are working together. And it, it's such a great resource. And we're going to give a real life story to kind of show you the value that that adds on a campus and in a zone that makes a difference because we get action much quicker. And to your question, how quick can you have officers? We've experienced that. And it's extremely quick, uh, much quicker than if uh, you didn't have a school resource officer. So we're fortunate. So I, I really applaud our efforts as a district to make sure that that's a priority to help keep our zones and schools safe. So, so we're going to give you a real life story that happened two years ago at Costa Mesa. Uh, there was an app that was developed uh, that allowed uh, for uh, anonymous uh, texting to come. You could say anything you wanted. Uh, all the students, it was kind of the hot rave, uh, had it on their phones, and you could say anything you wanted to. So. Um, and you wouldn't know who said it. And you could say it about somebody specific or a general saying. And so we were trying to contain this as, as schools and working uh, with, with Dr. D'Agostino, but I like Dr. Phil better because, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, trying, trying to get a handle on it because you couldn't trace who was saying, saying what. And so um, it, it was an afternoon uh, close to graduation, and then all of a sudden um, I had a group of about seven students come in, which again speaks to the relationships as well as the see something, say something. And it was very specific on, on, on the app, and it says, I'm going to shoot up to school tomorrow in the quad at lunch. That's concerning. 
Um, you know, you, we're not going to say, oh, it's probably nothing, right? We take every threat seriously. And uh, so we immediately, as you know, we had the kind of action chart there, we immediately get into conversations, start communicating, start working together to figure out, you know, what can we do to get ahead of this? Because we don't know who wrote it. Um, and so obviously immediately uh, go to uh, our SRO and start communicating and start getting anybody and everybody involved uh, to start the communication with not only the district, but also get other resources to see what we could do uh, to make sure that we are identifying this threat uh, and doing the best we can to uh, distinguish it before anything happens. Um, and that's where I'm going to let uh, Officer Torres come in to talk about how within 24 hours we were able to do that. About the uh, threat, about the threat, and I met with him in his office, and uh, he told me we had a couple of students who showed me the. Uh, they took a picture of uh, the threat itself. It was very concerning to me, and of course to Mr. Haley. And uh, I immediately got additional uh, assistance from a detective and got a hold of the Orange County Sheriff's Department. They have a smart team that deals mm -hmm. in threats, so I was able to get them all involved, and we were able to write a warrant to find out who had sent, even though it, it's supposed to be anonymous, no, there's no such thing. You know, you, you, yeah. you've, know. We get a warrant, we're going to find out who sent it, when, where. We were able to obtain that based on the circumstances, based on what we told them, and uh, we were able to identify who the person was, where it was sent from, when it was sent one, from what area. We were able to identify the person. So within a matter of 24 hours, we got this person, the student of ours, in, in, in in an interview, and he uh, he said that yeah he was the one that sent it didn't mean any harm. He just sent it uh, as a joke, believing that it was anonymous, that nobody was going to find out who it did it. But again, it, it took uh, a lot of uh, partnerships with me, obviously Mr. Mr. Haley, the Orange County Sheriff's Department, my detectives, you know the DA's office to issue you know, the warrant, a judge, and get that information to come to a conclusion that was obviously not a, no, a reliable threat. So it worked out all well. And again, it all comes down to having a good working relationship with, with our staff. In this case, Mr. Haley, the assistant principals, and everybody else that was involved. So it, it worked out pretty good. And we were very happy that it did. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and that's just a single example. But again, it goes back to that community where <laughs> this came from students, came to people that they trust, and then again, working and having the resources to make sure we could you know, deal with the threat and uh, handle it and make sure everybody was safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, the that kind of uh, is our report tonight. The, the, the question is, where, where do we go from here? And as you know, this is a report format. So mm -hmm. um, discussing next steps or, or concrete um, mm -hmm. proposals would not be appropriate at this time. But I do mm -hmm. believe we need to come back to you with some additional next steps. Um, there, the the, the the Florida shooting is less than two weeks old. It's going to be two weeks tomorrow. Um, as you know, if you've been following the news cycles, it's been cycling over and over. A typical news cycle is 24 hours. A Friday news cycle is the weekend. This has been cycling every day for two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, this is unheard of in many re you know, respects. Uh, so you know, we're going to be talking about proactive measures. We're going to be looking at additional training. But I do think we need to come back to you with some, some additional next steps. Um, the question, I do, I do want to leave you with this, the question that we are getting from parents and from um, individuals in the community is something along the lines of, can you guarantee my child will be safe? We're hearing that a lot. And, and the fact of the matter is that no one can guarantee that um, the safety of, of all students and all time, at all times in all schools um, in America. Um, or anywhere else, or in the community for that matter. What we can guarantee is that we are going to continuously support all of our safety systems and practices related to, to safe schools that are within our control. Uh, and we will continue to partner with law enforcement and parents and members of the community and our agencies to promote the safety of all of our students and staff. So thank you very much for the opportunity to share this report with you. And I'm sure we'll be back talking about this shortly. Thank you. Okay, um, Mrs. Fleur. Uh, thank you, Phil. Uh, Dr. Phil, I guess. Yeah, I like, uh, it's fine. easier for me to say. <laughs> a, a couple of things. One is, as you said, um, this news, the tragedy in Parkland is recycling mm -hmm. daily. Um, 
So the question I have is in terms of the, the mental health of our students and our faculty and our staff, as this, key, this pervasive, um, it wears on us, it wears on our students, it's frightening. Mm -hmm. Are we still helping address those issues um, at, our, at our campuses? for those individuals who may, in fact, need some additional support? Y yes, so I, I know that our psych support services team, which is made up of um, our social workers in, in the zones, had a meeting today to discuss additional supports that might be necessary. We are, you know, again, this is only the second day back to school from the spring recess. Mm -hmm. um, so what we have done is, um, is to develop a, a checklist, if you will, of things we need to get done immediately, um, inclusive in that is redoubling our efforts in mental health and wellness. Uh, we're, we're continuing to look at resources and resource allocation. When a principal uh, raises a concern about a student on campus, we're gonna bring people over. We had a risk assessment today at one of our elementary schools that um, we platooned, I think we platooned a, a school psychologist uh, from Estancia, it's in the Estancia zone to get over to one of our elementary schools. Uh, the, the, we do believe um, you know, we don't we don't have we don't have a lot of tools in the sense of a tool. If you think of like a, an object, what, what we have are our practices and procedures. And I do believe the robust resources we have in mental health are going to help us weather these, many of these school safety issues. Okay. And my second question is, um, I had the opportunity to take a group of Girl Scouts to, and I didn't know this, but and maybe you all did, that we have ac actually the FBI is in Orange County. Um, with the Orange County Forensic Laboratory, mm. and they deal with cyber crimes and cyber safety. And so, and there are police officers from each of the many d uh, police officers that are there. And they're the ones who handle all of that, and so they're the ones that actually handled, uh, they were called in to, to work with the, the you know, identifying, because they can do that. Um, but one of the issues that they talked to the girls about was uh, safety in terms of posting and making sure that, you know, don't post in front of your house. Don't post that you're somewhere until two weeks after you've been there, mm -hmm. because the minute you post where you are, that is a concern. That's a major concern. And I just would like to make sure that within our protocols um, and what we, when we're talking about internet safety and cyber safety with our students, that we are also reinforcing the fact of you want to be safe out there. So you know. You want to protect your family. Don't post that you know you're out of town mm -hmm. until you get back. Mm -hmm. Then post Good your point. pictures. It's okay to share them. Mm -hmm. Don't tag people. Um, don't you know? Get, put a street address on there because people there are there are there are mm -hmm. creeps out there. And so I just want to make sure that when we're talking about that to our students and to our families that we we engage the protocols and, and ensure that their safety fits, sure, yeah. that they um, know what they are. As you know, uh, Dr. Mishni has a cybersecurity um, presentation that she gives to our schools. I'll, I'll definitely double back with her. Okay. Uh, I know I'm giving one of the cybersecurity presentations to Victoria tomorrow, so we'll make sure that's in our presentation, okay. but I think that's a good point. Yeah. As, okay. the, as the internet, I knew I was next. I, well, I thought I was next. <laughs> um, I get to say your name, Mrs. Matoye. Yes, thank you. Thank you, President Snell. Um, as, this, as social media becomes more sophisticated, our responses and our training has to match that mm -hmm. sophistication. And exactly. that's a challenge since it goes so fast. Um, what I wanted to say, my original button pusher was, I'm comforted, while I'm not naive to know that everything's perfect, it's not, but I am comforted at knowing that we do not take threats as an idle threat. We do not say, oh, that's probably nothing. I'm sure it's, th we don't. We've investigated, and this has been shown to us at least in two illustrations, that we investigate that threat. We do everything we can to find out about that threat. And I am comforted in knowing that it was a prank and, and something mm -hmm. that was nothing. That's, that's a good thing, but if it had gone further, we would have gone further, oh, yeah. and I—that's a comfort. That's a comfort for our our district. Mm -hmm. Thank you, okay. Mrs. Yelsey. Yeah, I, you you mentioned that you've gotten a lot of uh, phone calls from parents saying, "Can you guarantee me that we're secure?" And I think for us, that is the most daunting issue that we 
take responsibility for the kids in this district. That is our utmost concern. So I know you're not coming to us today with recommendations or anything, but when you are looking at that and developing that, I think that's the biggest concern that we have mm -hmm. is are we doing everything possible in our control to make sure that our kids are as safe as possible. And the other thing is, in addition to that, is the mental health aspect. Mm -hmm. Are we doing everything in that area to, to make sure our kids have the access to resources they need? Yeah, and, and look, we want to come back with an answer of yes to those questions. Yeah. You know, I, we've been sharing that there really needs to be no daylight between what we are doing and what we should do. Uh, in the case of school safety. But it's, as you said, um, it's not an easy, it's a very complicated yeah. task. Uh, you know, one of the things that Principal Bolton from Newport Harbor mentioned is that, you know, even our, even our, even our campus footprint and our layout is, uh, is antiquated relative to potential school safety issues. Uh, I, I was talking with a parent this afternoon in his office uh, about, you know, how we, we sit down students in the middle of a blacktop for many of our drills. Well, in a, you know what I mean? These are, these are tried and true types of practices, but maybe they're not, maybe they need to be re-looked at in, in, the, in the case of um, some of these more recent events that we're seeing around the country. So these are all things that we are very mindful of. I can assure you staff in every division is, um, is working um, diligently and, and um, in concert with one another to make sure we can answer those questions for you. And I'm really um, pleased with the redoubling of efforts that's taken place um, for mental health. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've added triple two, two full-time social yeah. workers this year. That was a quarter million dollar exactly. expenditure. And your presentation, um, the last meeting was wonderful. All the things mm -hmm. we're doing to address that. So, um, so we're not forgetting how far we're we're going, how fast we're going to, to right. keep up with this issue. Um, I was hoping that the SROs would stay so that um, after we finish talking about this, if there are some audience members that want to talk to you in the lobby, would that be okay? Okay. I have some speakers. Do you want to speak I just first? Have one, okay. One, I just have Mrs. one Scott? question to ask, um, and, that, and I forgot to ask it, but you did mention about our elementary schools um, all going to be, they're all pretty secure. And I know that we are now looking at our high schools. And I just, I think it's important to, to state publicly that because our schools and our students and our staffs at those high schools are, and all of our schools are so important, there may be some trade-offs in terms mm -hmm. of safety. There may be some yeah. trade-offs. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to know that we are not going to back down on the safety because of aesthetics. That yes. if, in fact, we need to put perimeter fencing around, attractive, I'm assuming, perimeter fencing around some of our high schools that are most vulnerable, i.e. Newport Harbor High School, i.e. Estancia, i.e. Corona Del Mar, and i.e. Uh, Costa Mesa High School, then we will be doing it. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sorry, but I think it needs to be said that we take this very seriously. And as you said, our antiquated procedures are, they're open. Yeah, our I, schools are open. I so think we the need aesthetics sure versus safety mm -hmm. conversation exactly. is really re being rendered moot in light of the, you know, at Parkland, yeah. they had almost everything exactly where they needed it to be. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there's a, you know, exactly. I, we don't want to get into it, but, mm -hmm. you know, the, you, you can have, a very, very safe and secure, procedurally efficient mm -hmm. organization, right. still have it and we are still dealing with some very exactly. challenging yep. exactly. responses. So. Okay. And thank I'm, you very I much. I want to thank the students for staying. This yeah. is really thank important, you. and I hope you're able to pass this on to your, um, <clears throat> your peers. Um, I have two cards. I'm going to um, let these people speak now because we have the people in the room that can answer the questions and uh, the first one is Charlene Gazzoni and I also want to thank Charlene for um, on Facebook um, publicizing um, what we're talking about tonight and uh, bringing uh, the community together to talk about this. Thank so you. Thank you. Good evening board members. Um, can you hear me okay? A little, no. little louder. Okay. So my name is Charlene Gazzoni, and my son attends um, Costa Mesa Middle School. And 
I am here because I am concerned of the active shooting crisis in our country. And Dr. Navarro, you, I think you really touched on some of it when you said, we're not here or, or this district cannot handle gun control, mental illness, or um, anything else out of your jurisdiction. And that's absolutely right. That's down the road. It's too complicated, but we do have to address <coughs> the, um, the safety of our kids now first. So a few things that I just want to um, touch on, the essential elements of school safety. While that sounds like a robust program that's been um, put in place, I find it very interesting that there is no environmental safety on that pyramid. So it addresses um, uh, exercise and drills, and it, it, it um, includes being proactive and so forth, but it did not include our environment. And I think one of the board members um, spoke about the aesthetics of our schools and surrounding them with fences. Absolutely. We have a fence around Costa Mesa High, uh, Middle School. And my son was saying, but mom, it's ineffective because that um, the kids could put their arms through the gate and just open the door. And while um, Officer Torres is, I'm sure, very quick, by the time somebody fires a weapon, and I'm an a Army veteran, so I've fired many weapons, but by the time a, a shooter fires a weapon, it's as fast as they can pull the trigger. That's 10 dead in 10 seconds. By the time the officer can get there, 10 are gone. So I think we really have to look at our environment. In addition to that, I would like to propose no backpacks on schools and leave the, the, um, the um, lockers on campus. Um, some schools are now implementing no backpacks. I would like to also propose um, metal detectors, although some parents are saying they don't want to you know, lock down our kids. This is where we are now. This is the world we live in. And while you know, we can just tiptoe around it, we have to, to be more proactive to protect our kids in different ways. I want to touch real quick on, um, oh, I'm losing my time here. <laughs> um, the police are essential on campus, and they are very vital, and it's an awesome start, and I feel comfortable that there's one at Mesa. But like I said, by the time that active shooter pulls that trigger, it's as fast <coughs> as they can pull it, 10 kids are dead. So we need to lock down our campuses, put plastic around the push bars so the kids can't put their arms through and push through, get rid of backpacks, and anything else we can do now. But please pay attention to our environment. All the other stuff on that pyramid, it's all nice, but that's not gonna protect our kids. Uh, mental, il mental illness is a other topic. Thank you thought. for hearing okay. me, I appreciate okay. it. Thank you, thank, thank you, Shirley. Uh, I just wanted to yeah. address okay. the issue about those mm -hmm. panic bars. Uh, uh, we don't use plastic, what we use now is metal screen so that they can't push through it. So we're in the process of all of those exits, covering them with metal screen so that somebody from the outside can't open it by pushing the panic bar. We are required Good. by the state to have a panic bar because right. if something gets on fire, they need to be able to get out of there. So there's no getting rid of the panic bar to open that gate, but we uh, have been putting big metal screens around the area so that nobody can just reach over and oh, pull on the panic good. bar. Good. We have thousands and thousands of gates that we need <laughs> um, to work on, so <laughs> it's a uh, work in progress. But that's a good point, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Ruth Kabayachi. Kabayachi. Good evening. My name is Ruth Kobayashi and I'm a parent at Corona Del Mar High School and a community volunteer. And I'm going to read my information to you because it helps me stay on track. So I've prepared this for you um, this evening. Thank you for continuing to care for our students in our district. I'd like to respectfully request that as you prioritize the health and well-being of our students, that you focus on discovery analysis and recommendations from those with the most expertise, regardless of media or political pressure. Any of us can have opinions on what the best practices are. Um, in the reality that our students now face in 2018. But we owe it to these children to get the very best information from those most equipped to provide that information. It seems that what was adequate on campuses even a year ago is no longer enough. It is my hope that included in your analysis will be data gleaned from suicide clusters in Palo Alto and Colorado Springs, security audits from law enforcement, whether it be our PDs and or independent um, companies, reviews of disciplinary policies, including the path to law enforcement when necessary, 
to limit the possibility that what we saw in Florida could slip through the cracks at our schools. Review of the Newport and Costa Mesa PD hours on our high schools, ensuring that we have maximum coverage during school hours. Review of red flag and emergency procedures for all staff members to help recognize and respond to suicide risks or to campus violence risks. Review of communication protocols to parents when real or rumored threats are identified, including more widespread use of the Titan HST app. Um, too few students use it in my observations. Review of proactive communication to parents to build trust in the safety of our students. Parents are scared and rumors explode in mere minutes. Finally, several of us in the parent community are forming discussion groups to better deal with parenting challenges in today's environment. This came out of the suicide that we had on our campus. Our effectiveness could be greatly enhanced if we could piggyback on the partnership that the district is forming with a nonprofit group challenge success. I'm requesting that the district facilitate access to parent groups to instructional videos discussion questions or any curriculum that they may have. I've been on their website and I've looked around. So that me, we may work with common language and practices that the district will be using. We feel like we're already forming some parent groups. We've brought in some speakers. We feel that we could be more effective and consistent with the way you're heading if we can get access to the same kind of information you're using. And finally, just as a really important footnote, uh, we are very grateful for the leadership you've put in at our high school, and we are very grateful for our, for our SRO. It makes a big difference on campus. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Ruth. Uh, one more speaker. Um, I think this is Jerry Pacello. Uh, yes. Oh, Jerry okay. there you go. Come on out. Uh, hello, uh, my name is uh, uh, my name is uh, Joey Pacheco. I'm a student at Costa Mesa High School. Um, well, I would like to first thank the board for letting me speak. Mm -hmm. And my uh, what I would like to speak about is safety, which is uh, something we all hold dear now. Uh, and unfortunately, I just no longer feel safe in school. Um, this year alone, there have been 18 school shootings, an average of three per week. I mean, an average of three per week. And two of those uh, shootings have been right here in Southern California, one in San Bernardino and one in Los Angeles. Now, I'm here because I have some safety concerns regarding my school, Costa Mesa High, school, uh, Costa Mesa High and some, rec some recommendations for all uh, Newport Mesa Unified School District schools. Mm -hmm. uh, number one, I believe that if somebody wanted to come into, my uh, come into my school with a gun, they will have no issue getting the gun into campus. I know in recent years they have tightened security by locking all, all entry doors, all all of the entry doors, and making anyone who wants to come onto campus after school starts go through the front office. This is a great policy that almost nobody follows. <laughs> um, uh, from my experience, from being unfortunately late multiple times to school, I really, I, I really had to go to the front office because there was just multiple ways to get around that. Whether I just found a door they forgot to lock, or a student who was willing to open the door for me. Um, uh, and it's not just me doing this, it's everyone. Um, so my recommendation is that we add metal detectors to all of the main entrance. Uh, I did some research and found that a study, a, a 2000, a 2000, uh, a, a study in 2000 uh, found that in Chicago where they added metal detectors, it was able to prevent 294 weapons, 15 of which were guns from entering that sc uh, schools. My second, uh, my second recommendation is that uh, my second recommendation is that you require that all emergency all emergency firearms to acquire a key. Uh, I know that some uh, I know that some of my some of the firearms in my school do acquire a key, but not all of them. The gunman Nicholas Cruz in Parkland set off the fire alarm in his school before the massacre started because he knew students were programmed to walk out of the uh, walk out of rooms when he when you hear uh, fire alarms. Uh, my third recommendation is that we change our intruder drills. The way we do it now is that we are told when it's going to happen and at, ex at exactly what time, and all we have to do is just get on our desk. It, it, all we have to do is just get it under our desk. That's, that's literally just sitting ducks, in my opinion. I would recommend that one e uh, once a year on a Monday it is announced 
Uh, we uh, we will be having a uh, lockdown drill on a random a week, uh, and then once the drill uh, on a random time of the week, then once uh, th uh, the drill begins, the student's job is to either run or hide. If they decide to hide, they must barricade the doors and uh, grab whatever they can to uh, be able to. Sorry about. Go that. ahead and finish your thought. Uh, uh, and and once they um, then once the drill has begun, the student's job is to either run or hide. If they decide to hide, they must barricade the doors. And after that's done, they grab whatever they can and get ready to throw it. Uh, and, the st and while they're doing this, they're standing away from the windows and doors, obviously. Um, d uh, I had this kind of fun of uh, kind of a uh, weird idea, but during the, I would recommend that during the drill that we would have somebody walking around in a bite suit, like um, dog like when the training dogs in a bite suit and a motorcycle ha helmet, trying to get through those barriers, just testing the response of the students. And, uh, but I, um, I know this kind of sounds kind of silly, but I urge you to do something because these school shootings happen again and again. And it's not really a question of if it's gonna happen in our neighborhood, it's, but it's a question of when. And um, I know that it was a gentleman, a lady up here that recommended we should ban um, um, backpacks. I'm not exactly for that, but instead, how about um, getting, uh, I know they make see-through backpacks uh, now, which are kind of popular now, so mm -hmm. get, get okay. those. Okay, thank you very much. Thank I you, appreciate Joy. your coming to speak. Thank, thank you, you Joy. Thank you. Sorry, I spoke too long. No, that's okay. Um, and again, if you uh, want to speak to your principal or the SROs after when we go on to the next report, feel free, they'll be out out there to speak to you. I don't know if you have anything to reply or you, does anybody else have any comments? Good job. Okay, oh, thank you so. for your attendance and, your, and the presentation. It was very helpful. Okay, so. More to come. More to come. More to come. We're going to go on to our next report, and that would be um, Tim, Mr. Holcomb. You know, we're going to take a five-minute recess. Thank you. <laughs> Recess point. Um, we'd like to call the meeting back to order. Oh, wait, we're missing somebody. <laughs> Okay, we'll get the superintendent. Um, oh, community input. <laughs> no, we're missing Mr. Navarro. Oh, yeah. We're missing our secretary. Yeah, we're missing our secretary. <laughs> there was a line. There wasn't a line before you called a break, but then there was a line. There was a line. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There he comes. Oh, he's out in the <laughs> lobby speaking with the parents. Good. Okay. Mr. Holcomb, if you want yeah, to start. Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm not the only one. Yay. Well, it's the superintendent. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's good. Thanks for sending the usher. <laughs> Thank you, President Snell. <laughs> I was just checking with uh, Mr. Marsh because mm -hmm. we also have our consultant here this evening and, and seeing oh. who I'm going to call on first. Okay, and and I am going to call on Mr. Marsh, uh, our director, uh, administrative director of Facility Support Services. And he's going, this report is to give you the update on the work that we've been doing at the Estancia High School Science Wing in particular, but the high school as a whole uh, we last updated you at the end of November, letting you know that we would be uh, continuing to monitor the air quality uh, at the school and continuing to check to see about making some corrective repairs. And uh, Mr. Marsh is here to tell you that we are done and we have a good report for you. Good. Good. I want, I want a good report. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm 
going to wait for Ryan to turn the lights on. But um, we, we did last discuss uh, this in November. And at that time, we were uh, waiting for uh, the winter break so we could do some work uh, in the locker rooms because, as we all know, high school athletics never stops. So we were looking for a window that we could get into the <laughs> locker rooms and do some work, um, which we did. Uh, we uh, also met and went over. We, we got the facilities department and the maintenance department all together in the room and went over all of the plumbing plans again. And it was one of those, okay, all hands on deck. Did we miss anything? Is there anything here that we didn't catch? And so we went through that process. And what we found were in the science wing, there were four uh, cleanouts in the floors that weren't on the original list to verify. Um, three of them had not been touched during the course of construction, so they were fine. Uh, fourth one had actually been removed because they had intercepted the line, tied it into the demo station at the teacher's desk, and everything was done fine. So um, we, we made it through that process. If you, if you remember this graphic from last time, <laughs> it looked a lot more like um, a street light um, in the, the red, yellow, and uh, green. This is basically two shades of green. The dark green shows the areas that we had checked and repaired over the summer. The lighter green colors are everything that happened during the course of the school year. In the science wing itself, we had uh, 45 locations that we checked. We had uh, problems at 19 locations. All of those were locations where a line had been abandoned. Everywhere where they had tied into it to connect to do other uh, work to um, serve as other areas in the room were done up to code. So uh, we, we made those repairs. We found that that was somewhat consistent as we looked around the rest of the campus. When we look at the whole campus, we have a variety of areas uh, that we're looking at. In the top left, let's see if the laser's working. Up here is the um, F building um, on the plans, boys and girls locker rooms for okay. everybody else. Um, and so those were the, the last areas that we were looking for over the break. Um, and uh, getting ahead of myself. While we were going through all of the research and our industrial hygienist was doing the readings, we found that in the science wing, in two of the rooms, while the readings were way below any of the hazard levels, but a couple classrooms where the readings were still there. We were still getting some readings. And so over the break, we did a, a, another smoke test in those two rooms, and then we cleaned all of the acid neutralization tanks on all the sinks in that wing again. We had done it over the summer, but we did it another time. And we found that one was pretty dirty when we addressed it at that mm. point in time. So for now, until we get a better handle on um, what that looks like, because they're recommended to be cleaned every other year, what we're doing now is inspecting them monthly. Mm -hmm. um, and if we have a consistent problem, then we will service it more frequently in that particular area if that's necessary. We're also <coughs> having some conversations with the instructor if, if they're doing really doing anything different mm -hmm. than anyone else is, which so far doesn't appear to be the case. Mm -hmm. um, but. We have some photos here for what we found in the boys' and girls' locker rooms. Yeah. Um, this is a wall in the, in the boys' locker room. Now, it, it says before repair, but we've cleaned it up enough to show where it is. There actually was a concrete cap over that, but you could see the circle of concrete, so we broke it out to check it. Um, it had a rag stuffed in it and concrete poured over it. So we broke the floor up a little bit to get down around it, properly capped it with bands and a rubber cap. We had a second location. This one is its kind of hard to tell. This is the pipe sticking up. It's actually got a chip out of it. Mm. Um, and afterwards, when it's repaired, it's got a, a rubber cap on it and a, and a banded um, connector. Uh, and these are abandoned, right? These were abandoned. So they are still abandoned? Correct. They're, OK. Yeah. Um, and here's another one. This, this is what you would normally see when we would open up the wall. We'd see this. You can just see a little bit of the black pipe uh, and then the concrete uh, in it that's filling the end of it. And then this is the same one repaired after. The girls presented it a little bit differently in that it was a nice run on one wall and um, 
was the same issue uh, in four locations, uh, but uh, it was a lot easier to take care of. We were out of anything that was tiled. We were able to approach it from the hallway side, so uh, we didn't have to disrupt tile or anything like that. So uh, these, these were all addressed over the break. Um, and again, we, we sat down with uh, all our folks in the room from facilities and maintenance, went over all of the plans in additional time. The only thing we found that could be remotely questionable uh, that we hadn't verified were those four areas in the science wing. We did check those. Um, and uh, by the lead into the break, and, and uh, Mr. Ginsburg, our industrial hygienist, will talk about the uh, testing for the air testing, but those numbers had dropped significantly prior to the break. During the break, we actually pulled the equipment out for the two weeks um, and then brought it back in after to, at that point, verify, okay, all the repairs have been made. Let's see what happens. Where are we? We had, uh, during this process, we had ramped up the amount of outside air that we were bringing in to make sure we had plenty of fresh air. Um, prior to the break, we brought that back down to the 20%. We wanted to get readings mm -hmm. back at that base to mm -hmm. know where we were. Mm -hmm. um, and so the two weeks after uh, that um, we'll talk about in a minute um, were much better numbers. Um, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna steal Daniel's thunder, but I do want to say we've gotten to the point where the meter outside that was for a control has higher readings than anything inside. Wonderful. Well, which great. is a wonderful yeah, place to be. That's great. Thank you. That I'm going to ask Daniel Ginsburg to come up and present. Good evening. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity to present a brief overview of this report. My understanding is that you all have uh, the main report and Appendix A and B. The entire report, uh, or you have it available to you. Mm -hmm. uh, the entire report is, uh, with the raw data, is about 11,525 pages. Oh. So uh, okay. being an environmental <laughs> company, we would uh, ask you not to print out the raw data unless you really have a desire to look at it. Um, so basically, as you know, there was a, a community, community concern over the potential exposure level at the OHIA uh, uh, REL. OHIA is the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment. REL is the reference exposure uh, limit. Uh, OHIA, for those who are not familiar with that organization, basically establishes uh, reference levels for the state and county agencies to use. It's more used as a um, uh, more used as a um, uh, for risk assessment. Uh, OHIA acknowledges that their numbers are maybe an overstatement and that they're not intended to be used as a, a go, no go in terms of being over it doesn't necessarily mean that someone's being exposed to something. It's more in a, uh, a risk assessment. So to refresh, uh, what we did was we looked at rooms uh, 701, 703, 705, 706, 707, 708. Uh, rooms uh, 702, 704 were not sampled because there is no historical complaint of the odor in those rooms. 706 was chosen as a control room because there was no uh, historical complaints in that room. And as the pro project went on, it was monitored from, uh, the seven rooms were monitored from October 19th to uh, December 19th. They took the break as uh, Tim indicated and then we resumed from January 5th to January 26th. Approximately 12 weeks, 724 for hydrogen and sulfide. Uh, as you know, this is a continuation of two previous reports that have been done uh, at this campus. Uh, it was currently focusing on the chronic, uh, the OHIA chronic uh, REL and the OHIA acute REL. Uh, those are both uh, one-hour time-weighted averages. As you can see, uh, the acute is uh, 30 parts per billion, and the chronic is 7.1 parts per billion. 
Uh, to put these numbers in perspective, uh, the uh, Cal OSHA regulated levels is 10,000 parts per billion. Okay, so we're talking about an incredibly small quantity. Uh, in terms of uh, the ability to uh, smell hydrogen sulfide, uh, an unacclimated person would probably be able to detect it in the range of about 100 parts per billion to about five, uh, 5,000 parts per billion. Uh, someone such as myself who's worked with it over the years probably would not be able to detect it at the lower limits. Uh, approximately 387,000 data points were collected, uh, one data point or uh, every minute, and that was 724 over the 12 weeks of Monterey. It's data logged on a, a direct reading instrument. There's photographs of the instrument in the report. Uh, initially, the instruments were deployed on the teacher's electrum uh, uh, demonstration table. Uh, that was found probably within two days of their placement that it was uh, disruptive to the teaching process and so they were relocated uh, in uh, cases uh, placed at locations along the perimeter uh, as designated by the department chairman Mark uh, Cyrus, uh, excuse me if I mispronounce his name. All right, and then I already touched on, but basically the data points were used to calculate the one hour time weighted average for the, and compared to the OHIA uh, chronic REL. Overview of the major results. Okay, the, the first and most significant one is that the sampling results indicate that observations in this science wing in terms of potential hydrogen sulfide are safe for continuous occupancy and should not pose a, a hazard to the typical occupant. The results are typical of a normal building operation and results are not suggestive of an exposure. There were a couple isolated instances in which the hydrogen sulfide was above the odor threshold but there was no reported odor complaint associated with those isolated mm -hmm. instances. It's important to note that no instrumental readings uh, during the typical school day exceeded the one hour OHIA hydrogen sulfide action uh, acute re REL or the one hour OHIA uh, chronic REL. The vast majority of instruments, measurements outside of the typical school day, and I'm defining the uh, typical school day as being uh, 7.30 a.m. to uh, 3.30 p.m. And uh, obviously outside of that would be uh, 3.31 p.m. to uh, 7.29 a.m. and all day Saturday and Sunday that the vast majority of measurements uh, did not exceed the one hour time weighted uh, OHIA chronic number. Uh, three samples outside of the typical school day did exceed the one hour uh, chronic uh, number, but uh, in, a, in of themselves, it's probably not significant. When we're looking at levels this low, there's uh, the, always the potential of uh, instrument error. There's always the potential for uh, interferences. There are several potential interferences, uh, uh, including uh, common air pollution. Um, Daniel, yes. if I could offer one other quick observation on that, is yes, there's, there's typically no one present at that time, which also typically means that the AC system is, is not it? operating. Right. So therefore, you don't have air circulation happening during those periods okay. of time. So since you don't have the introduction of 20% outdoor air all of the time during that time, if there were a period where you would expect to see uh, those types of levels, it would be during that period. And even then, there were only three readings. Is Thank that you. correct, Daniel? Yes, that's very correct. Thank you, Tim. Continuation. Uh, Obviously uh, and predictably, as the uh, plumbing issues were addressed and repaired, 
We saw the uh, number of readings between three parts per million and seven parts per million decrease. And uh, I should add, uh, and it's, it's in the report, but uh, the reason that uh, three parts per billion is the lower limit, of, uh, is the limit of detection of the instrument, is that the, the instrument is not capable of seeing uh, quantities below three parts per billion. So even though if you look at the raw data, uh, the raw, in the raw data, it will be uh, listed as zero. It does not mean it's zero. It means that the, it's less than three parts per billion. Okay. And in terms of our calculations, we considered the three parts per billion as the lower number rather than zero. Uh, although OHIA has established a uh, chronic level, um, what we have seen there is that this would not be considered a chronic level uh, just by virtue of the definition that we're, is, we're looking at a chronic level as being a, a preponderance of uh, measurements of the, in the ambient air over an entire year. Okay, so mention that. Okay, in terms of major recommendations, our recommendations are very similar to the previous uh, set of recommendations. I'll point out the new ones as we go through. Obviously, no further sampling is recommended. We're already at an incredibly low level. Um, all the levels we measured, uh, not only were they below the OHIA chronic level, but they were also below all other known regulated levels for hydrogen sulfide. So they're way be, uh, extremely below CalOSHA, extremely below the EPA guidance level, uh, below the ACGI consensus levels. So it's a, a fairly decent situation. All right. Uh, again, in the previous report, we obviously recommended that the, uh, the dampers should be open, that they supply fresh air continuously uh, during occupancy. Uh, that the, that the fans come on uh, at least one hour before the start of the, uh, the school day or one hour before the contractual day and extend one hour after the contractual day. The only, uh, only additional requirement to that, if the school is closed for two or more days, then the uh, air system should come on uh, two hours before the uh, contractual day so or the school day. day. Uh, this is just to uh, flush out all the effluents that have built up inside the rooms during the period of closure. Okay, a new recommendation is that all timing schedules be rechecked after any power outage, whether it's planned or unplanned, um, that as you transition uh, to or from daylight savings time, as you know, daylight saving time has been creeping back and creeping forwards. So a lot of the pre-programming devices out there are now out of sync. And whenever this system is serviced or worked on. Okay, uh, continuation of re recommendation from the previous report is to ensure all plumbing traps are filled with water. Obviously, to contact us if, uh, if the odor situation resumes or is present. And I might add that uh, during this uh, uh, study, there were uh, three days in which odors were reported. When the, when the odors, when the issue was uh, researched, it was uh, found not, to, it was found to be unrelated to the hydrogen sulfide. There was uh, uh, other issues that are common to schools common to buildings. And of course, to uh, provide the study, uh, provide access to the study. Uh, it is my understanding that the study was posted in a uh, shared drive at the school in which the entire faculty has access, faculty and staff. It, it has not be been posted oh. yet. It will get oh. posted tomorrow. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Sorry about that. So. And this information was, was presented to the staff yesterday. Oh, that's good. Uh, uh, so uh, anyone who had wanted to attend could attend that uh, session. And uh, that's, that's uh, hopefully this will become a rapid uh, distant memory. <laughs> that would be nice.
Okay, we have a couple questions for you. Um, Mrs. Floor? I just have a question. You know, when you're building a house, um, you have an inspector that inspects, and given the recent article in the LA Times today about LAUSD and their cafe issue with their three contractors and overbilling and overcharging, did, did we have an outside, I mean, did we have a building inspector or was that part of ours? Or, because I guess this has happened in Measure A. So did we have, did, did the city of Costa Mesa no, the city of Costa Mesa doesn't provide inspection. Uh, all inspection of schools is under the auspices of the Division of the State Architect. Okay. Uh, the Division of the State Architect certifies inspectors, and there are contract inspectors, and there are also, in some cases, districts that have inspectors. Okay. And uh, these projects were all, all had an inspector okay. uh, at the time, and um, were all concerned that uh, unfortunately some things uh, were signed off that shouldn't have been we don't know because construction projects are, are, as to there was an inspector uh, inspectors are always looking to try to catch everything on every construction project right um, we're, we we found this unusual as well that there were uh, this many places that it didn't get caught uh, in by the inspector during construction. And we don't know whether, in fact, that was the code at the time, or common practice at the time in, in with, construction. With regard to what? In this, terms of stuffing with no, rags it's not and. No, common practice. Uh, okay, this that's was clearly just, not common practice. Got it, okay, thank you. And the, um, the person that, the company that did the work was? The, the, the company that did the work um, was a contractor who, who won the bid uh, to the district. We then investigated to determine whether or not this contractor worked on any other projects mm -hmm. uh, where we might want to go and look to see whether or not they, mm -hmm. um, there were concerns like this at another mm -hmm. site. And uh, we did not find that they had any other projects that we should be investigating. Is that correct, Mr. Marsh? That is correct. Neither did the plumbing subcontractor. Neither one of them worked on okay. any others of our but, schools. But the project manager, who was the project manager? The, the project manager was a, a McCarthy staff member. The inspector on this particular project was a in-house district inspector. Um, and we did an audit of the other schools um, that, uh, we did the modernization on, which is almost all of them. Yeah. Um, and uh, we didn't find anything else reported by anyone. Um, and we just did a visual inspection, a non-destructive visual inspection. And we didn't find anything that appeared to be out of place um, with that visual inspection either. So are these two uh, contractors, the plumbing and the, uh, the construction, the general, are they still in business? Uh, the plumbing con the uh, sub is not the uh, general contractor is still in business. Um, they uh, it, it would appear they shuttered for a while during uh, the, the late 2008, 2009, somewhere in there, um, and have since reopened. Okay. Um, whether it is exactly the same folks or anything, we we don't know. And and finally, could we get an accounting of exactly how much does this cost? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Black. I'm just, Mr. Ginsburg, I would really appreciate it at some point when you have nothing better to do <laughs> that you would uh, make yourself available to our students because I know um, I did not print off. I started to print off the report, and when I looked at the 11,000 <laughs> pages, but, yeah. but at our family, they went, boy, this is really interesting. I have no idea what I'm looking at, but I thought it would be... The kids would get a kick out of it and uh, and learn something from it because, you know, they don't really know how many different avenues there are out in the world that, you know, that may pique their interest. And it would be really terrific sometime, you know. When you're yeah, I'd, I'd welcome that. Yeah, well, we would love that too. Thank you. I'd also um, want to make sure that the report is available to the public. I don't know how we do that, but I'm sure... Um, Annette can figure it out <laughs> so the public can access it. Okay, we have a speaker. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, we have a speaker, um, Britt Dowdy.
Good evening again. Um, so I had some prepared uh, comments, but, uh, but I'm also going to speak on behalf of uh, uh, Steve Crenshaw, who intended to come tonight, but he's mm -hmm. had some health uh, things flare up today and, mm -hmm. and wasn't able to come. And one of the comments is we've talked, uh, as I've talked with the Estancia staff and, and uh, specifically with Mr. Crenshaw, that he wants to remind this board is that um, I think the the, uh, the science teacher staff who's been the, the group who's been involved with these meetings and been getting updates and myself are uh, definitely pleased with the level of professionalism that Mr. Ginsburg and Mr. Marsh and Mr. Holcomb have taken to oh, to a very high quality environmental air testing. Uh, both back in May and then do a follow-up more detailed testing which is what we were they, they went above and beyond our expectations over the course of this fall mm -hmm. uh, and definitely our maintenance staff over the course of the summer was able to very quickly get a repairs done and turn it around and have things operational for the start of school uh, so there is a high degree of satisfaction with the work that was done in the inspection um, but the reminder that that has come up in my conversations uh, with staff is that a lot of this air quality testing has happened after the worst of the smells and that the worst parts of the smells had happened prior to these events where fans were brought in had to go through a classroom uh, students could smell it on a regular basis staff were kind of in that for for several days or got displaced to other classrooms so there are moments of the history that we don't know what the thresholds were because there was no equipment there was no testing we don't know uh, and that had been ongoing for a number of years. And there are concerns about their health. Uh, I, I know the one teacher in question is very concerned about uh, his health has been impacted through not having these repairs done over a period of time. Uh, and um, whoever, whatever the reasons are, that's just kind of a fact that, that he uh, has reminded me of. Um, one thing I do want to um, uh, echo is, Mrs. Snell, what you just mentioned about making this report available. Uh, this information presented here is very consistent with what we at NMFT have kind of, uh, you know, made a, a, a written request to have these exact same mm -hmm. elements put mm -hmm. in some way that's digestible, it's easy to find, it's easy to read. Uh, this was a great uh, springboard here. Uh, I think just taking this video snippet and finding a way although we're having trouble putting videos available, so maybe making this you know, a written version of this exact same content is what we're uh, hoping to get. Um, I think it does a good job of saying, you know, here's how many repairs we made, mm -hmm. here's why the air is safe, here are all the things that we have done, here's before and after photos. Uh, that's exactly what we're looking for, uh, as well as maybe kind of giving a bit of a timeline as well so that people can get to it if they want to. Uh, so just in general as a union we're, we're dedicated for safety for employees for mm -hmm. students uh, and also responsible stewardship of public funds so that is our uh, part of our core mission as well mm -hmm. so thank Great. you for doing the work and getting the repairs made mr hulk and mr marsh and mr ginsburg thank you thank you and i oh okay oh, go ahead mrs matoyer i just want to thank you for bringing it to our attention because once you did that we were able to get mr. Holcomb's team on board <coughs> and then it could get fixed but my question is as we often ask can a copy of the PowerPoint be available because the PowerPoint is what we can understand as opposed to the 11 10,000 1200 certainly we, we can make a copy of the pages. PowerPoint available okay thank that you. would be great thank you okay so Moving on, um, community input. Uh, this is an opportunity for the public to address the board on consent calendar agenda items or on non-agenda items within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. Per board policy 9323, each speaker, individual speaker will have three minutes to cover one or multiple topics and speakers may not cede unused minutes to other speakers and there is a maximum of 20 minutes of comments per, talk, per topic. Per, per, with board <laughs> consent, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public comments depending on the topic and the number of persons wishing to speak. The board, staff, and members of the public may request that a specific item on the consent may be moved to discussion action. Requests to move consent items must be received prior to the time the board takes action on the consent calendar. DVD copies of the complete meeting are available to check out from the superintendent's office 
for three day business days prior to the purchase for one or purchase for one dollar. Okay, um, Dr. Dowdy, would you like to speak when we get to that item, or do you want to speak now? Okay, Dr. Dowdy. <laughs> Uh, good evening again. Um, so what I wanted to speak to is kind of a broader political context. And so there is a lot of debate going on, you know, across our nation about different political issues. So the first thing I would remind people is register to vote, uh, mm -hmm. get involved in the political process. Um, and, and remember that, that June primaries are very important in that political process. Uh, specifically, what I wanted to speak to is to remind voters that there are several educationally uh, relevant issues at stake in the June primary, specifically the uh, Orange County Department of Education has a board trustee election in June. Uh, we have a state superintendent race going on in June. And then of course there's all the other statewide offices that everyone knows about like the governor and mm -hmm. uh, congressional districts and things along in uh, assemblymen and uh, state senators. Uh, but the, the, those statewide offices specific for education are things that are important. And so I would ask voters to reach out to the PTA leaders, reach out to CSEA leaders, reach out to our leadership in NMFT, reach out to you as school board members and the superintendent and other trusted persons to find out what the important issues are and then go educate yourself. So this is just a general plug, uh, get out, register to vote, pay attention to these uh, issues that are not on the front page of the Wall Street Journal or the front page of the LA Times and maybe they're in you know the mm -hmm. California section on page six or maybe mm -hmm. it's in uh, some other place you have to dig a little deeper uh, so uh, basically we're you know got about three and a half months and people need to pay attention because those June primaries are going to be very important for us in our school district and what happens for kids in the classroom mm -hmm. Good point. thank you uh, Cynthia Blackwell. Hi, good evening. I um, was going to go online today to find the board agenda, and it's not very easy to find on your website. If you click the link, it takes you to another page, and on that page, it says board, it, said, it says agenda and minutes October 2008 to present. So if you click on that, you just get October 2008, all the, minute, all the meeting times, but no agendas. So after like 10 minutes, which made me very irritated, I finally went over to the box that had today's minute, today's meeting, and finally it clicked open. Oh, there it was. I thought, you know what? <laughs> when I was teaching, we were constantly being told, 21st century technology, learn how to use it, blah, 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 teach your kids. I'm thinking, this is a horrible example of a school district's website. Somebody needs to get in there and fix that goofy thing for the agenda so when the public can find them like that and not have someone from 2008 show up. And it doesn't go to the present. It just goes to 2008. Secondly, I wanted to bring up the fact that you used to have a split screen. So if you're watching it at home, you could see whoever's speaking and then the board members. And now you just have like a little close up of just the actual person speaking. So it'd be nice if they could go back to having it be so you can see both sides of it. And uh, another thing is the um, overall technology. Sometimes people come up here, like I would have shown you what I was talking about. If I could have used a computer, I would have given you a little demo, <laughs> a little lesson on how to find your agendas. But you don't have that technology available for the public, and I think that's a big flaw. And then also, um, staff minutes. Staff, at staff meetings, we used to be able to ask our principal, can the site rep have time for NMFT to talk? And they always ask, yes, you can have it at the beginning or the end or whatever time. It would be nice if the school board would allow our NMFT and um, CSEA to have actual time as a report as part of the board minutes. Because it's these guys and everybody that they represent that makes it possible for you guys to be sitting up there on the dais. So that needs to be something that needs to be concluded, is to have them have actual report time like you guys have. And the last thing is, under the safety thing, is um, we used to do flag decks, and used to have the entire school sing out there as, at flag decks on Friday mornings. And then we moved it to Tuesday, and then it was like Thursday. They, were, they, start, they started moving around two years ago, at least at Kaiser. 
we always felt like we were sitting ducks out there. And we used to say, gosh, we hope no one ever comes up here and starts shooting us all down when we're out here on these flag decks. So when you're talking about school safety, that's something that you might want to revisit is when you do the flag decks, make sure that they're not always the same day, always the same time, because we always felt like sitting ducks out there. So that's it for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Sherry, do you wanna do you wanna explain how to get on to the agenda? On the homepage on the uh -huh. side, yeah. it says what are the conditions Can you talk <coughs> into the mic? Oops. Oh. Oh. Yes. <laughs> if you go to the home page on the right hand mm -hmm. side, mm -hmm. you will see the Board of Education minutes and a link to the current board agenda. It will I can show you. Mm -hmm. It will take you immediately mm -hmm. to the board. There she comes. Page, huh? She's going to. And you just <laughs> click on the today's date, and there it is. Yeah. Okay. So do, I don't know if we need an instruction. Oh, there that it says, is. There it is. We're yeah. getting. Actually, uh, on the, it's the it's to the far right. On go the on the go on the meeting for the bench. So sorry to interrupt. I just thought it'd be. No, that's good. Right so down here to the right. There's Scroll various down. ways to get to it. One is board. You can get to current <coughs> board meeting agenda. You can also get to current board meeting agenda this way. And I'm sorry, Sherry, I know you're responsible for this. I just thought no, it'd be easier to show it this on here. No, this is good. This is good. Hooked up there. Um, so right the here. current one's always the one at the top. But it doesn't say that. 327. There it is. Yep. No. Uh, yeah, I have never had any problem. And for Unless past board meetings, you do have, um, <laughs> what do we have, agendas and minutes here. Mm -hmm. And there is a link to prior ones. There was an an antiquated system I believe we used to use before mm -hmm. and then we have them all from 2015 to now in this link which is the same one so there's just various ways to get to it yeah but that's, that's a much easier that's way that's <coughs> Sorry. but it's right okay. on the first it's on maybe the first we could page. do a workshop to show people how to mm -hmm. do yeah, it you know yeah click well sometimes I don't know to click on things if it doesn't say click on it <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, maybe it was some Were you on your phone? No. <laughs> okay. It's right there on the right. Okay. Okay. We have a comment. Um, yes, Mrs. Floor. Um, uh, Britt brings up, a, um, Dr. Dowdy brings up a very important uh, point, and that is um, educating the electric, you know, electorate mm -hmm. on education issues and such, and especially um, given the fact that our elections in 2018 will be a different type of election. We were going to district-wide elections. I think it's really incumbent that we talk about offering a class um, and start it, you know, put it on. So even even prior to, I know filing deadlines on uh, for school boards um, for September. For let me put it this way: Fi there are filing deadlines for a for the November ballot, and that occurs, I think, in. August. Um, it might be really um, beneficial that we schedule and publicize a couple of meeting dates um, and some training, some introduction class, you know, a class on, hey, what does it mean to be a school board member? Um, or a workshop for anybody that's interested. It doesn't mean that they they are going to run. It doesn't mean anything, but just to just to start educating, especially with our new trustee elections, that we'll have four trustee election, you know, trustees up for election, and you know, I read in the I read in postings. Well, we need to change all four. Well, the the fact of the matter is that each individual voter, where it used to be that they could vote for four. This time they can only vote for one, the, the trustee. So there needs to be some education. Um, so I think that we should entertain and have a conversation about um, starting the processes. They can come and meet the superintendent, the cabinet, some of you know the leadership here, um, school board members. Maybe offer them ability to shadow um, board members so that they get a feel of what what's involved in the job. Um, so they can make a you know make a, a informed decision on whether they'd like to run or not and stuff like that. So, I'm not recruiting, but I, I yeah. think it's important that we have those conversations. So, um, how would we go about that? What would be the, the what's the process for doing that? Well, Just you started the process. Okay. <laughs> there you go. And we'll look into it and come okay. back to you with some ideas. Okay. I'm sure there are school districts that have done it. I just don't know any right now. But yes, just a thought. 
Okay. Actually, what we have is something that's, that's <coughs> once you filed, it's between the filing and the unfiling, or it's after the filing? It's after the filing. Because okay, I know we, we have a, we, we, do a we do a training for those individuals that who are, are running. Who are running so that they know, but. Um, no, but I agree. I think you can always meet me at Pete's Coffee because okay. before I never run as Martha <laughs> Blow just and Ms. Franco, I meet with several community members that are interested and we do a question and answer and walk them through. Okay. But it, but it's it, to me it is important because it is. it's very different mm -hmm. um, yes. because Excellent. they're not in the at large anymore and so. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, another speaker, Melissa Richardson. Good evening, everyone. Um, I came tonight because I wrote an email to the board mm -hmm. uh, last Monday on the 19th, um, and I wanted to uh, make a couple more comments about it. Um, I wrote that on that day because I was hoping to have um, some kind of uh, avenue for the probationary teachers to find some recourse before the deadline for this board meeting. Um, because they don't under the current setup. Mm -hmm. um, there was only six business days to figure out why this was happening after the probationary teacher was notified and also then to object to it. And that includes the day they were notified and the day the resignation had to be turned in. The next thing I wanted to address was that there is no process to contest the issues or allegations that was mentioned to them. Um, and I think that that, it's very alienating. There should be a way for them to say, I object to this, I don't think it's correct, I would like you to investigate it or look into it. And that wasn't available. Um, and then the only recourse then is to resign or acknowledge to the district that the district that district's no confidence vote in them, as is tonight with the um, board's vote to accept the resignations mm -hmm. um, in number 16C3. Um, and I also mentioned in my email that I would like the board to be a safe place to turn because the letter of the notification um, of the release and non-reelection uh, basically makes it look like the district has already made their decision and the board is there to finalize it. Um, and there's really nowhere for the probationary teachers to turn. And it sounds like we really don't value them as a school district. And although I'm not a probationary teacher, <laughs> I'm a library media technician at Harborview Elementary, um, I have been through the Kenshin program. And if I were a probationary teacher, I would never want to work in this district, and I don't want that to be the case for this district. So I was hoping that the board could look into the timeline and hopefully add more time because um, in the ed code it says that they have to be notified by 315. Um, and if the resignation had to happen by the March 13th uh, board meeting, it would have given the probationary teachers a chance to come to this meeting and be heard, and they weren't. Um, and to have a process for them to object, because I think that's very important. Um, so thank you very much for your mm -hmm. time, I appreciate it. Thank you. I just uh, would like to ask uh, Ms. Olson to provide some background on this. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there are certain laws that uh, provide for uh, the uh, either the promotion to permanency for probationary teachers or for the release of probationary teachers. And it's a very specific set of rules for second year or first year probationary teachers. The, we have different rules for temporary teachers and we have very different rules for permanent teachers. So I'd just like, like to ask Ms. Olson to provide you with that information. Okay. Certainly, good evening. Yes, the, the timelines for the release of teachers probationary, um, both probationary one and two, is a statutory timeline, and it is March 15th. So in other words, the board needs to act upon it, and then the employee needs to receive a letter by March 15th. As a district, we have been more proactive than many in the fact that um, 
the statutory guidelines do not require us to give any notice whatsoever that they are going to receive a non-reelection um, on March 15th or prior to March 15th. We don't believe in that. We believe in the fact that we do need to have some conversations with those employees and give them the opportunity to look at whatever options may be available to them. And so in order to do that, we do notify them in February, bringing it to a board meeting um, prior to. The other th one of our other challenges is our, with the timeline is that with the March 15th, if our board meeting is March 13th, that's a very, that's a two-day window in order for us to give notice. So therefore, we have to take action prior to that, which would be this board meeting. I, I do want to say that we work with our teachers um, in conversations. Our administrators do provide evaluation and feedback to them. When there is concerns or an employee believes that it is not an appropriate evaluation. We have had conversations where we've gone back and we have revisited and we have looked at it and ensured that the decision is done fairly and without bias. And there have been cases of that where um, decisions have been revisited and reconsidered. Uh, and I can't go into any exact examples, unfortunately, as personnel matters, but I do want the board to know that our administrators take great care in um, communicating with the employees and, and bringing them along and letting them know what the expectations are. And part of that process is that when uh, an employee receives any kind of uh, evaluation that's going to go or notification that's going in their personnel file, they have a right to respond to that in writing and have it uh, attached to that document. Uh, so there is a right to always to respond. Uh, and that that's the kind of information that, uh, you know, the HR office will then discuss with the principal and uh, who makes the final recommendation, uh, legally is resp responsible for making that final recommendation to us. So um, uh, it's not that they don't have a, a, a point uh, or an opportunity. They have every opportunity every time they get anything in writing from us. So I have a question. So when they're notified that they're not going to be um, reinstated, um, so how much time do they have to, how much time do they have so if they wanted to reply in writing? Or, Go ahead. So yeah. with any written communication that is given to an employee, such as an evaluation, they have 10 days from okay. receiving it to have a, to ask for it to be attached to the document prior to it being placed in their personnel file. Okay, so when they have the rec <coughs> when they get their performance evaluation, mm -hmm. that is when they have the opportunity to respond. So so I not to talk specifically about anybody. So can I assume that that those that are released didn't get a very good performance review? With those that are released, there are concerns indicated on their performance okay. review, which is done, it, their evaluation is done in December. That would be the first one that okay. is completed. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second one, of course, in the spring. Um, okay. Uh, I think there needs to be some clarification, however, mm -hmm. um, in terms of can you clarify between a temporary teacher and a probationary teacher and their rights? We can't hear you. Can you, uh, can you explain the difference between a probationary teacher and a temporary teacher and their rights? Certainly. Because I think there are, some, there are some significant differences between the rights of a temporary teacher and the rights of a probationary or a probe two. And a, and a tenured and a permanent teacher. Yes, there are some nuances that are there. So with um, probationary teachers or a teacher on a probationary contract, is an easier way to say it, who is on the road to permanency, the March 15th statutory timeline is there. Um, so in their first year, they would have two evaluations, second year, two evaluations. On the first day of the third year, they become permanent. In those first two years, if we are not, if we are going to non-reelect, which means that we are releasing the teacher, and we would not be bringing them back to any other position within the district, that needs to be done by the March fifteenth timeline. With temporary teachers or teachers on a temporary contract, there, the March fifteenth deadline does not apply to them, and so we could actually release at the end of the year as a non. 
uh, reassignment, meaning that we would not bring them back to another position, or we can we release them and we may bring them back to another position. Mm -hmm. We choose to do the non-reassignments at the same time that we do the probes, mm -hmm. um, which is the timeline currently right now. Um, I, th I believe it would, does that answer? Yeah, so in other words, I guess the, the question is, so that we just have it clarified for the public, we, we choose to, instead of waiting until the end of the year for our temporaries to be released from a temporary contract because they're, we, we offer them the opportunity and give them the March 15th so that when they either resign or are released, which we can do for whatever reason, um, they have the opportunity to resign and can look for another job. Is that basically correct? We do get, we're trying to give them ample time ample to recognize time. that they would not be considered in a future position, whereas other temporary employees who are released at the end of the year, we would. Okay, okay. great, thank you. Thank you, thank you for all the comments. And um, we're gonna move on to the superintendent's report. Did we vote on that? <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm catching up here. Sorry. Right. Uh, I did want to share with you. Um, you heard Mr. D uh, Dr. D'Agostino, Dr. Phil, uh, <laughs> Dr. Phil, uh, 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 share with you some uh, information we got from the state, um, uh, and that was triggered actually by parents calling the the, the state to find out uh, if we were actually meeting all of our requirements oh. for notifying mm -hmm. uh, parents and students about issues uh, about school safety. Uh, and I shared that with you, I, sh I sent that to you. Uh, and what was pointed out in that document was that uh, not only did we, did we meet the state requirements, we exceeded all the state requirements and that we provided uh, more than adequate notification. Um, but I think what, what I wanna clear up here is that um, our communication when we're conducting a risk or a threat assessment, if we believe we need to share that, we need to make sure we have all our information correct and that it's confirmed by our partners in, la uh, in law enforcement. We will not put anything else until all the facts are confirmed. And uh, that's just very important to us. Uh, so uh, while people would want us to get something out within five minutes, we're not gonna get anything out in five minutes. We're gonna give you updates about what we know. And in the end, when we have every all the information, then we'll send out a complete uh, a summary or informational message out to all families. In this case, we didn't finalize that till the afternoon after students were gone, so they got nothing from the school. So we sent it to the uh, parents who have the email of record on the student uh, information system, which is really our legal obligation, is mm -hmm. to send it to the parents. And, uh, and that's what happened there. So, But the state, I, uh, I shared with them our communications. I shared with them the responses to the emails that I shared with you to some parents who had mm -hmm. shared some concerns. Mm -hmm. And I shared with them uh, the letter that was sent out to, to one of our schools. Uh, and they then constructed the response that was uh, really quite uh, 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 re reinforced and mm -hmm. confirmed that we're doing as much and more than expected. Um, now we're going to go on to consent calendar. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Just flip the page. Move approval of the consent calendar. Second. Why well, should I read this? Um, yeah, I think you should. Okay. You need to read All it. items listed under the consent calendar are to be considered by the board to be routine and will enacted by the board in one motion. This includes the consent calendar for business, mm -hmm. education services, human resources, <coughs> students, support services, and superintendent. There will be no discussion of these items prior to the time the board votes on them unless members of the board, uh, staff, or the public request specific items to be discussed and or removed from the consent calendar. Public requests for, of items to be discussed and or removed should be submitted in writing prior to the board's consideration of the consent <coughs> calendar. Okay, so we have a motion by, I didn't. Mr. Davenport. Mr. Davenport. And a second by Mrs. Black. And a second by Mrs. Black. I, I just have oh, two. You two have a comment? Okay. Yeah, I have two questions and I can we can pull them. That's fine with me. Um, or I can, okay. just a question. Um, one is 16B. Four, except the Williams second quarter report. Mm. Just a, a refresher on that one. 
you want us just to give you that refresher right now? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Mr. Sure. Lee Sung, can you go over the process for the Williams report second quarter? Just for the public? All right. Um, so th we are obligated by law to um, present to the board and to our public uh, the uh, reports that we get from our County Office of Education related to all of the Williams uh, regulations. This is the second quarter report. Uh, it's attached to uh, our board agenda uh, for the board and our public uh, to view. And in this report, it states that there was a site visit to uh, College Park Elementary School, which they are required to do, uh, found that there was no uh, facility deficiencies. Uh, it also reports, and this is a little bit odd, uh, this is a second quarter report that we're presenting to the board, but they cite any complaints that were filed in the first quarter. Okay, That's what so, I want clarification So on. those complaints will always be one quarter behind. So uh, in the first quarter of this uh, school year, there were no complaints filed. So I guess my question was because we had a number of individuals who came to speak at the board level that said they filed a complaint. Do we have we received that complaint? They claim we that they we filed. Have, have we received a complaint? Mm -hmm. we, we received uh, some complaints in the second quarter. So that will come in the third quarter. Yeah, and, and so that will appear in our next uh, report that we get from OCD in the third quarter. Okay. And then the second one was the, the contract with uh, Callahan Consulting, and thank you very much. But he's also going to be providing some additional work. That's correct. Thank you. Okay. So... Um, any more discussion on the consent calendar? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. We'll move on to uh, public hearings. Okay. We are legally required to conduct a public hearing to receive any public comments related to NMFT initial proposal and the district's initial proposal. The public hearings, one for each item, are the appropriate time for comments to be received on these two items. If you have comments to share regarding the NMFT initial proposal, come forward during 17A to share your comments. Each speaker has three minutes. If you have comments to share regarding the NMUSD district initial proposal, come forward during 17B to share your comments. Each speaker has three minutes. We will not be calling for comments again when the board takes action on these two items. Okay. We need to open the meeting. Okay. So <laughs> open, the open the hearing. The hearing. I'm not going to use the ding dong thing. <laughs> I don't think it's respectful. I need to bring that closer. Okay. Um, so the public hearing is open. The public hearing is open. Move to no it. No speakers. No speakers. No speakers. So we'll close it. And the public hearing uh, for 17B is open. No speakers. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll close it. Okay. Okay, moving on to discussion action. Move adoption of resolution 290218, calling for full and fair funding of California's public schools. Second. Second. Okay. Do, any comments, or do you want to I'd speak? I'd like to, to read it in the public record, but I don't, you know, whoever okay. else would like to read, it's fine, but I think it needs to go into. Okay, do you want to read it? You might adjust, I'll just pick out a couple of them. How does okay. that sound? Um, uh, this is calling for fair and full funding of California's public schools. Whereas California has the sixth largest economy in the world and the largest gross, gross domestic product of any state in the nation, and whereas despite California's leadership in the global economy, the state falls into the nation's bottom quintile on nearly every measure of public school, uh, K-12 school funding and school staffing. And whereas California ranks 45th nationally in the percentage of taxable income spent on education, 41st in pure, pu per pupil funding, 45th in uh, pupil teacher ratios, and 48th in 
pupil staff ratios, and whereas K-12 school funding has not substantially increased on any inflation adjusted basis for more than a decade, and whereas under local control funding formula, state funding for K-12 schools has only this year recently returned to the levels predating the Great Recession of 2007. Whereas California's investment in public schools is out of alignment with its wealth, its ambitions, its demographics, and the demands of a 21st century education. And whereas in 2007, a, a bipartisan group of California leaders commissioned a report titled Getting Down to Facts, which stated it would take an additional $17 billion annually to meet the State Board of Education's achievement targets for K-12 education. And whereas in 2016, the California School Boards Association report, California's challenge adequately funding uh, uh, education in the 21st century, updated the getting down to facts data and determined that adjusting for inflation additional 22 million to 40 billion, 22 billion to 40 billion annually would be required to provide all public school students with access to a high quality education. Whereas California trails the average of the top 10 states by almost $7,000 per pupil. Mm. Um, uh, th now, therefore, um, and whereas if California is close to opportunity and achievement is, is to close the opportunity and achievement gaps and create a public school system that offers consistently high levels of education, the state must provide schools with the resources to meet these needs of their specific populations. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the governing board of the Newport Mesa Unified School District urges the state legislature to fund California public schools at the national average or higher by the year 2020 and at the level that is equal to or above the average of the top 10 states nationally by 2025 and to maintain at the minimum this level of funding until otherwise decreed. Okay, okay. so do I have a motion? So moved. <coughs> second. second. You have second. We okay, a, a second. Motion. We already had the same motion. Okay, so we so roll will um, so roll do a roll call. I should do it before. Before we vote. Yeah, we should. You don't care? Do you want to speak? Okay. No, yeah, he can speak. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he should speak. Dr. Dowdy. <laughs> So I was going to speak in uh, support of this resolution and just wanted to let you know that the CFT on yeah. a state level has uh, similar resolutions that are coming to convention. Mm -hmm. In fact, yeah. I'm on one of the PTA. councils that crafted resolution almost right. exactly like this in many ways. Um, uh, they're also, I know, in LA Unified that they have a 20,000 by the year 2020 campaign, which is extremely aggressive, but they call it their 20 for 20 campaign. And I was on a phone call last night with CFT leadership, and they were talking about maybe we should uh, come up with another campaign that's for the 10 for 10, where we just get to a $10,000 per child state funding level within a 10-year time frame. And maybe that's a, a more for manageable sure. campaign that, yeah. that maybe we, you weave into some of the different politicians running for office. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to let you know, uh, as you probably already do, that the CFT is highly invested in this exact same uh, issue. Uh, they are, are very interested in moving forward together and if there are ways for the CSBA leadership and CFT leadership to partner together, that would be amazing and I am very willing to help with that effort. Terrific. And, and I know that um, CFT is very involved at the state level with the Education um, Alliance, with all the, the, the groups meet on a fairly regular, they meet monthly, do they still meet monthly up in Sacramento? Uh, Appreciate okay, that. Great. Thank you. Okay. Roll call. Ms. Snell? Yes. Ms. Matoye? Yes. Ms. Fleur? Yes. Mr. Davenport? Yes. Ms. Franco? Yes. Ms. Black? Yes. Ms. Yossi? Yes. Okay. Um, 18. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, you, you say Go ahead. I'm jumping. Oh. <laughs> 18B. <laughs> Approve tentative agreement between the Newport Mesa Unified School District and the Newport Mesa Federation of Teachers regarding unit member services calendar. Do we want uh, Mrs. Olson to speak on yes. that? Okay. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good evening again. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, tonight we are very pleased uh, with the ratification by NMFT um, and are seeking the approval of the TA, which would close out our 2017-18 negotiations and, and set the stage and allow us to move forward into the next round um, for this coming year uh, for 18-19. Um, the negotiations went well. Conversations were, were um, of a very deep level around the collegiate calendar, but we did come to a resolution to have wh what you see before you tonight with um, the 1819, and hopefully we can move into further conversations um, moving forward. So we seek your approval tonight. Okay. So moved. Okay. Second. Uh, second. And by um, Mrs. Floor, a any discussion or questions? Okay, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Okay, it carries. Thank you. Uh, 18C, receive the Newport Mesa Federation of Teachers initial proposal to the Newport Mesa Unified School District for negotiating negotiations commencing 2018-19. Move approval to receive the Newport Mesa Federation of Teachers initial proposal to the Newport Mesa Unified School District for negotiations commencing 2018-19. Commencing Second. Okay, do you have anything you want to say about that? <laughs> Mrs. Olson, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so springboarding from the uh -huh. from the last item uh, is that this is the opportunity to receive and to review uh, NMFT's initial proposals, proposal for us as a district. Okay. Any questions? Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? Okay. That Quite passes. a comprehensive list. <laughs> 18D. Um, Move to receive the Newport Mesa <coughs> Federation of, uh, let's see, this is, oh, I'm getting that wrong, sorry. That's, I've got two of them the same one. Receive the new. No, one's receiving the second the, one, the, the third one. Approve the district's yeah. initial. Oh, there it is. I'm, I'm just like crazy here. That's okay. Uh, move approval of the Newport Mesa Unified School District initial proposal to the Newport Mesa Federation of Teachers for co negotiations commencing 2018-19. Second. Okay. Mrs. Olson. <laughs> Yes, it's all connected. Okay. Uh, which is, this is, um, we do seek your approval on uh, the initial proposal from Newport Mesa Unified School District to NMFT. Um, I, we are looking forward to getting to the table and enjoying our, um, engaging in conversations to reach ag agreement. I think that you'll see that there are some common interests between the two proposals. And so we seek your approval tonight. Okay. We have a, um, a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, wonderful. Okay, moving right on to board member reports. And I'm going to start with Charlene. Thank you. Ms. Matoye. <coughs> Fortunately, everybody had a week off, so we all had a little bit of a break. Um, mm -hmm. I'd first like to congratulate the Costa Mesa High School cheer team on winning national championships in small noun, tumble, and timeout. <laughs> no idea what that means. I know Mrs. Floor does, but good on Costa Mesa cheer and their coach, Corey Johnson, for being national champions, and that's very exciting. Um, I went with Mrs. Snell and Mrs. Yelsey to T. Winkle School yesterday for a tour of the school and and to sit with the principal and talk with her and it was Dr. Putnis was a breath of fresh air, mm -hmm. not that it was a new breath of fresh air. We can have many, but it was a <laughs> it was good to see wonderful things going on and we were also able to participate in the new pilot, Mr. Drake. We mm -hmm. were able to watch three different classrooms that were implementing online one which I will learn the names of it when we adopt it I'll memorize it but right now it was the online and the, the were, kids were yeah. working with manipulatives and they were engaged the teachers were enjoying it and I'm, I'm looking forward to the results on that um, Mr. Holcomb would you mind giving us an update on where we stand on the HVAC 
schools for this summer. I mean, we, <laughs> we said we were gonna ask for lots and lots of updates, but we've been so concentrated on Estancia that I wanted to make sure we don't forget that piece. Yes. We're on schedule, but if you would like us to come with a more detailed report uh, at a future meeting, we certainly can uh, come and do that for you. Perfect, thank you. And my other question is probably to Mrs. Snyder. <laughs> Where are we in our process of, of closed captioning our meetings? Oh, good. Perfect, thank you very much. <coughs> and let me double check. Oh, one thing, um, I'm, I'm incorporating this instead of our report reports. I was attended the Chamber of Commerce, Edu Costa Mesa Chamber of Commerce Education Committee and tentatively pencil in May 23rd for the Les Miller Scholar Awards for the city of Costa Mesa. We're just waiting on. Will it would be a dinner again? It will be a dinner again okay. at the Turnip Rose. That is a very, teen-focused teen dinner, which those of you that are very adult eaters, it's great to go there. They had an open soda bar, and it was really great to go be able to drink soda all to your heart's content. And mm -hmm. they've got a great program planned. So that's my report. Okay, thank you. Ms. Floor? Yes, I had the opportunity to uh, participate in, um, in a visit from West what was it, West Covina? West Covina. West Covina, saw a lot of old home week there. Uh, uh, Chuck Hinman brought a team from Mount Sac about early college. It, it appears that um, they're gonna be located on the Mount Sac, San Antonio uh, Junior College campus. Uh, they, the majority of the individuals there were from their faculty senate from Mount San Antonio, so they, they because they have a lot of control over classes for freshmen and sophomore. It doesn't look like the, uh, their freshmen and sophomore are gonna be able to take uh, classes the first year because of the faculty senate issue. Um, but I'm talking to uh, Dr. Martinez, um, early um, is really on the map. They've had visits from Santa Ana um, Unified to take a look at their the program. They've had people from Orange come and talk to them. They've also had a couple from San Diego that are, are re-energizing and trying to re revamp their program. So it was quite uh, it was quite a, a great visit. Um, the second thing is uh, I was able to um, along with Mrs. Snell. I was in the back end. I was with the middle school when on. Friday the 16th, and Mrs. Snow was at the front end with the, the high school. Again, I wanna commend the staff um, for and here at the district office for sending people out. Um, they did a wonderful job. Uh, my kid didn't wanna go, but I said, you're going, you're going, and oh, mom, <laughs> you know, grandma, you can't, you know, and I took her to school, and then she came back and she goes, this was great. I said, what was great about it? She goes. I had 10 kids in my class, <laughs> and I, we got to do a whole bunch of interesting things and have good, some really good discussions. So um, I'm sorry that there weren't more kids, but the kids started trickling in once, um, once they realized that there was not a threat and there was lots of opportunities for them um, to have some one-on-one -on -one time with their teachers, <coughs> which was great. So, so again, commend the staff for their proactive approach. So that's my report. Mr. Davenport. No report. Mrs. Franco. No report. Mrs. Black. No report. Mrs. Yelsey. Yeah, I just want to mention one thing. As everyone probably remembers, two years ago, the Special Olympics took place in Los Angeles. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the week before that, Newport was a host mm -hmm. town. Well, because of that, we got involved with our Special Olympics and we have that we've had every mm -hmm. year since. Which is but great, they, by the they way. now <laughs> want our, our, have decided that uh, in conjunction with the city, the police, the city of Newport Beach, the police department, the fire department, um, local officials, and us, we had a meeting yesterday with uh, Candy Barella <coughs> and her team and special ed, and um, are gonna be involved. They are having the first ever um, hoop shoot, mm -hmm. and it's going to be a, a unit, unity torch walk, which will take place on April 5th, 
at the city at the Civic Center from six to nine o'clock. Mm. And it will be there's going to be a torch walk that'll be passed off from city officials, police, fire department, mm. and from Newport Mesa. And they're going to walk up through the art walk, you know, oh, at cool. the Civic Center oh, yeah. and come down. And then they're going to have uh, special ed cheerleaders at the bottom cheering. <laughs> and they're going to have a, a motivational speaker, and it'll be a barbecue. So the website's not up yet. As soon as it is, I'll pass it on to everybody. Oh. And then there's going to be a basketball tournament on April 28th, a special ed basketball tournament. Mm -hmm. But that's a afterward. But there will be, for this, there will be a hoop shoot with the low hoop, you know, little mm -hmm. Fisher Price hoops or whatever, <laughs> and, you, and for people to form teams. And there'll be teams. I know the fire department is forming one. That, and I said cool. that I could probably get, there'll be five people on a team. I could probably get a board team. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, okay. 350 yeah, yeah. That's how they're raising money. <laughs> but, um, you know, different people will be having teams. So it'll be a fun event. And I'll provide more information. I know they're going to work through Peach Jar to send out information to the entire district. The date? That's great. April 5th. Oh, yeah. yeah we're going to be in yeah. San Antonio. Oh. Well, the, no, not. the basket. Okay. On your okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the I thought you said the hoop shoot was a twenty. I could do those. No, no, no. But <laughs> oh. no, the the thing at this at Civic Center will be April fifth okay. from six to nine. When's okay. the hoop shoot? That's, That's part the of hoop that. Shoot. Oh, yeah. okay. Then there'll be a basketball tournament later. Oh, okay. Well, that. maybe you can play in that. <laughs> uh, that reminds me of the spirit. They're starting the spirit run, but uh, could. Could we have a report on the status of the community run, the Costa Mesa community, community run? Runs because moving to my September. understanding community is, community runs moving till yeah. September. But my understanding was that there was talk about eliminating it because it's going through. Nope, so I just want to get all cleared up and make sure that we're still on board. Uh, the community yeah, so run will be in conjunction with the fish fry. Mm -hmm. Both were moved to uh, September 21st and 22nd. Uh, and they moved from June to September. To keep from going through the Fairview Park while breeding the is nesting. happening or During nesting, the nesting or whatever. Season, yeah. this, so they had to, to move keep those the critters dates. happy. Yeah. Could we have a Spirit report on the the, so, uh, the, the, the the outcome of that because um, school will just be in session, and how are we going to just so we can just have a you know, conversation about you know registrations and the impact of having it you know before we could get kids registered and get everybody registered and because parents and kids were in school. Now with only three weeks before it occurs, just want to know but what they, the logistics they were in school before. <laughs> well, they were in school, but yeah, because they could register from January all the way up till mm -hmm. June. Now mm -hmm. they won't be in school for three months, mm -hmm. and then the, mm -hmm. they'll be in school only three weeks before the... Since I'm on the Lions Club mm -hmm. and, and the fish it's fry is in conjun conjunction with the run, mm -hmm. the city is very happy that mm -hmm. we were amenable and moved yeah. our dates. Yeah. So they are going to really help us out with um, notifications and sending out mailers. Okay. And so okay. Good. Yeah. Uh, between the city Thank and the, the run and the fish yeah. fry, there's going to be a, a car show during that time right. as well. So it will be I highly publicized. I know the community run people are happy with it as well because okay. mm -hmm. the city is going to really back those two events um, since they moved us kind of out of the time that we've always had. Okay, so I just want to make sure that, our, you know, our kids can register and mm -hmm. the participation level. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you want I just want to yeah. quick an amendment, especially since NMFT is in the house. Mm -hmm. um, a super compliment to the staff at Killybrook for their math morning. I know in the Costa Mesa High School zone, all the schools are having a math parent event. At Killybrook, it was done before school to attract the most number of parents so that they could um, uh, participate with their students and then the kids went to class and the parents went in for a short little uh, in, in information moment with our TOSAs. But the fact that every grade level had representation before school to make that happen, it was during their contractual day because we have to be at, you had to be at school 30 minutes before school starts. So it was, but it was seamless. It was well attended. Between 200 and 300 parents were there, and so cool. it's fun. I mean, the the workplace events that align with our math. And I have been around to several different schools in my, and inevitably someone comes up to me and says, 
It's a lot of work, but boy, this math program is fabulous and the kids love it. And we couldn't ask for much more than that. So I wanted to make sure I yep. shouted out to Killybrook. Thank you. Okay, so I would like to um, form a committee, uh, I mentioned this last time, on um, um, selecting a student board member. The mm -hmm. process, the, um, uh, the application, uh, what the responsibilities would be. And I want to um, start it pretty quickly because we, I think that we would need to choose someone <coughs> by May, June for the following year. Um, there's a couple of options on how to do this. Um, one is we form an ad hoc committee, but if we do that, we can only have three members. And at the last meeting, there were mm -hmm. more than three members that are interested. So we could form a board committee, a board committee and it would be subject to the Brown Act, and we could um, have our meetings that way. So I just want to hear good. what you would like to do. It doesn't really matter to me and um, I, I would like to be on it so could um, uh -huh. could we also could, yeah, that's just Which what I was going to say I was like just going to say I, I would really like to have um, the, the principals um, an opportunity to have their uh, their um, their so I think that having a board committee or a bo even a board study session to take a look at it I am happy to not be on the committee mm -hmm. um, but I would I, you know, I can do some research, mm -hmm. and I can I can do I can participate that way by providing you some some background information mm -hmm. on other districts and get in contact with other districts about what how they do it because I know that some do do it this way. Um, it's a change, and so we want to make sure that we get it. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever right we decide, we, we want to make sure that it starts in September um, because we have to coincide if it's. If we're going to be doing the appointment, then it, we have to take it out of the ASB process because it's considered an ASB office. Exactly, so, and it was it was also suggested to me that um, we um, contact. I'm trying to remember who it was. Uh, the selection process about the selection process. Um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Too, I I'm know. Sorry. Well, there I is know. a there is a student. There is a there is an organization. <coughs> called student board there's a student board member association California student board member association yeah something, something like that some, I can't remember CSBA, the exact name. CSBA do, do they have a CSBA student has student board reps so they should yeah. have no they they CSBA CSBA the, the board member the dis, member districts have student board members some of them do yes mm -hmm. Um, but there is also an association of student California Association of student board members um, and so we can get their information on how they how they select also I can get I have okay. that information at home too. so can we just go down the line do you want to be on it you you know does it do you want it to be a ad hoc committee is it okay for it not to be <coughs> well I, I could see I would like to be on it mm -hmm. as well but I think a, a study session would be nice with okay. other people yes. included okay so I think it impacts the board and it does. We should and, all be and it really, we've done this before, many years ago, mm -hmm. and in you know absolute frustration, we have had really, oh, really? great luck oh. with amazing students that, and you know, and like then we've had you know really frustrating you know, years. multiple years of. So I think it really does, you know, if we do a study session about it, a workshop, whatever you want to call it, then that will also we can get out to the community and let them know that we're searching. Okay. It might be somebody that has a really, you know, but, but we will need to be Talk really clear of what our expectations mm -hmm. are because it is exactly. time consuming. It is. It's very time consuming. Okay. So I'm hearing we, we need want a to do. We could schedule a meeting before a board meeting or on a fifth Tuesday. Well, if we have the, the, if we have the principals here, I hate to make, make them stay late even more. When is the next fifth mm -hmm. Tuesday? I think uh, what you should, I think what I'm hearing is you want a, a study session. We could do it a three o'clock study session. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the, to be honest, the, the principals are going to hand this off to their activities director. That's right. Or, okay. <laughs> and, yeah, or, and so we probably should have a, a rep, principal cross, or designee. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we should probably have a, a cross section representation of uh, administration and, and some of the uh, staff that uh, run the activities programs so that we can. Uh, hear from all 
affected parties. Okay, but it's uh, open to all students, and they would right. Okay. Yeah, uh, and we might invite some of our uh, uh, student uh, advisory yeah uh, mm -hmm. uh, I students it, to be part I of it. Mentioned it at our last meeting, okay. and they kind of had this blank look over their face. So you know, um, <laughs> I, I mean, think, I have to come and stay the whole meeting. Well, I, that's right. You know, I think mm -hmm. that they need to understand what is our expectation, you know, and what do they? What you know? How would they like to? And they might want something in a road, you know, maybe the student ad advisory committee chooses someone to come to one once a month meetings out of their committee over the year. Well, that's what that's what we can talk about is the different right. variations. There's no nothing set in stone and we need to make it flexible, much like adjusting to the drought. When there's a drought year, what what do we do then? And when there's a surplus year, how do we handle that? And and I think having the kids there is is it's always a good idea to I include the students I mean, that they would be involved. Exactly, and especially that, the things that have been going on, uh, the students' voices, they're really making their voices heard, and um, I'd Snell like to encourage that. that. <laughs> yeah, okay, so yeah, okay. so Mrs. we'll schedule. Snell, I was gonna share um, mm -hmm. from our last meeting mm -hmm. to, uh, not, I'm, they're in a process of bringing us their feedback, oh. but I asked, I had the opportunity, Costa Mesa High School hosted <clears throat> the, last meeting um, we switch around to the different schools um, and which is really great um, you know because mm -hmm. they get to meet each other there and see their school surroundings and kids and oh my gosh they all look similar <laughs> but different <coughs> but, but I did ask the question um, because of you know the um, the tragedy in mm -hmm. Florida mm -hmm. you know how do you feel about do you feel safe in our school I think I just asked do you feel safe in our schools? And they all raised their hand, everyone did, including the um, advisors. You know, the, mm -hmm. they're called advisors, right? <laughs> and our employees. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. but so they're gonna they're gonna talk. We're gonna have a discussion about it, and they're gonna talk to their peers and bring it back because we kind of switch gears a little bit to talk about the culture. They mm -hmm. want to have input in the culture. Mm -hmm. and they definitely have strong opinions about it, but. But I think it, you know, we need to be patient with them to formulate that. And sure. So I'm excited. Yeah, they're okay. Definitely dynamic. Can, Moving forward, go ahead. Can we? I had a request that was shared to me with from one of our principals after they were out in the lobby discussing, and since right now it is a topic that Dr. Phil, Dr. Diagostino, alluded to that is it's going around, in Mrs. Floor, that it's not going away, the discussion on school safety. Can we include a, a mention or a piece or some part of it in our agendas until we feel comfortable or <coughs> maybe once a month? I mean, it doesn't have to be every time, but I know we were getting updates. I know we, to we were told we were going to get updates, but it's not that I really want to be here till 10 o'clock. Well, like, I, like you heard, Dr. DiAgostino is going to lead the process and uh, we'll, co we'll com be coming back with you Perfect. with more information. It may not be right away, but it will be within, you, you can bet it's almost every Time. other board meeting. Okay. Okay, I'll finish my, um, sorry. That's all right. Uh, so I, I don't think I mentioned this before. Uh, sh we went and saw Shrek. We did. And I have to yeah. say, that it, what a great production. Mostly Estancia students, but uh, also students from Costa Mesa High School and Corona Del Mar High School. And Newport Harbor High School. Oh, I didn't think there was anybody from Newport Harbor. It was Harbor. Newport Harbor, not Costa Mesa. Oh, was it? Mm -hmm. was it? Not Costa oh, Mesa. Costa I Mesa apologize. Didn't That's okay. Newport Harbor and not <laughs> Costa Mesa High School. Right. Costa Mesa and High School has bring it on this weekend and next weekend. No, go ahead. But I think what was so, <laughs> what was, not only was the production fabulous, um, it, it was so um, wonderful that the um, theater teachers got together and collaborated on it. And it was held at, um, Newport Harbor, and so the students at Estancia who don't have a theater yet were able to experience all that backstage kind of stuff and the lighting, and and um, it was it was great. I think we really felt good about uh, the teachers collaborating, the students collaborating, and it, it was just a number one um, production. I really really liked it. It was a yeah, good it was production. the best. 
So I wanted to mention that. Also, I wanted to mention, um, and I'm going to give you all a copy of this, although I'm sure a couple of you already have this stuff. It's about um, uh, Senate Bill 328, which is about a pupil attendance start time. Uh, the California PTA and the, and the California PTA is, um, is supporting it, and it would make it um, mandatory to start school at a later time. I'm, and with that, as pointed out by CSBA, who does not support it, right. um, there are some issues that could, um, yeah, they could influence that. Issues um, like um, transportation, athletics. Yeah. And Would you like to continue? A lot of rural schools. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yes. Yeah. So I'm going to give you this information, and um, I hope the public. Um, I, I just Googled it. It's not hard to find. Um, another one of these things that I think um, Dr. Dowdy was talking about is to. It's it's not on the ballot, but it, you know you need to be aware of these things that are going on and um, whether you want to support it or not. So. Anyway, that's, and, and I just did want to mention, and I noticed you have um, HVAC meetings scheduled at the schools that are getting it, and that's, that's wonderful, reaching out to the schools so they know what's going to happen, um, community that's meetings. Good. Yes, yes. Are okay. Are at the door? <laughs> oh, Nell, if Mrs. You, Black. Um, I was wondering, um, and I haven't gotten anything other than a brief overview from CSBA, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but... The reason they're not supporting this particular mm -hmm. amended bill mm -hmm. is because they're, it's, it's giving the entire, State all the different districts, okay. you know, um, the opportunity to change it, which, which I'm in favor of having mm -hmm. choice. Mm -hmm. However, um, this is a good step in the right direction. So I think, you know, maybe we need to let our legislators know that we're, you know, in favor of it, however. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, it's, a good, it's a good idea, but let us work it well, out they for don't ourselves. Want, they, I, yeah. CSBA's but position is that this is, would be a mandate, mm -hmm. and that school districts come in all different sizes, and we we pr we, we promote control. local control, and the issue becomes one that we have a thousand school districts in the state. Many of them are elementary. The majority of school districts in the state of California are elementary school districts. Okay with populations under 2,500 students. And this is really talking about start times for high schools. It is. And so is. that's where the issue becomes, mm -hmm. is because elementary schools, um, and then there's the 712, and there's mm -hmm. athletics, mm -hmm. and all of those. And, and there's, there's a having, teacher, teacher uh, work day. an elementary school student and a high, high school, school student. student. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. And so there are a lot of issues, and, and CSBA is not opposed to it. They're just opposed to having a mandate that requires all school right. districts to be on the same time, um, and when that when one size does not fit all. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay I'll, but I will give you this research. I'll give you the uh, information if you don't already have it. Okay, so we're moving on to um, any board committee reports. You did. That was my legislation report. I yep. brought okay. it. So. Okay, so <laughs> informal report. I uh, have um, oh. CS uh, oh, Crop Coastline ROP met. Uh, we are still in the process of, of looking at different uh, delivery systems. One of our students was rec recognized um, and came and spoke. Um, he actually took a class at another campus, uh, but he was wonderful. And then we received a letter from a young man who took the EMT classes from Coastline and was also happened to be his first job on the job was with the Colorado derailment. And so he was a first responder. He That's his job. He's working in Colorado and he was there and he wrote a letter to us saying, thank you for my training. I was there. Me and my buddy knew exactly what to do. We were able to because of the training that he received. It was a student Yay. from Saddleback. So it was wonderful. Um, we did share the, the tragedy that we had occurred, and I can assure you that all of our surrounding districts, um, Preston, uh, Huntington Beach, Saddleback, and Irvine are all taking a look and all, all also are having conversations uh, surrounding the issue of mental health 
the issue of, of teacher, the issue of all of school climate, and how do, how do they reconcile those, and how are we going to be handling it? So it's having a ripple effect, and so I'm sure that we will be um, in contact. Irvine has used the Challenge Success Group and found it very successful, so there are conversations occurring throughout um, the area. Okay, thank you. Okay, your turn. Formal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just like to thank you for on your week off of reading all the stuff I sent you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And because uh, I, you know, it was a, it was a. It's uh, we've had two tough events, uh, mm -hmm. one in our district, one in our nation, mm -hmm. and uh, I just appreciate that uh, you were there to receive the information or to uh, uh, see the communication. Uh, that was going between me and some of the parents who were mm -hmm. very concerned. Um, and uh, on your week off, when you're supposed to be off enjoying yourself, uh, you took the time to, to, to look at that stuff, and, and some of you responded. So thank you very much. Thank you. You don't report. No report. <laughs> you reported enough. Well, I'm pleased to report tonight that we received uh, clearance for the Estancia High School pool to open from Yay. the Department of Health. And uh, it's been given back to the coach for use. Oh, uh, good. As of today. That's amazing. As of today. Tomorrow? Okay. <laughs> as of Actually, they're, they're, they're working on, uh, there are a couple of pieces to the lane lines to put in. They've got a meet uh, uh -huh. at another school tomorrow, so they won't be in tomorrow. Uh -huh. But they're looking forward to Thursday, if I understand okay. correctly, right, yeah. Mr. Thursday. Marsh? Yes. Okay. Thank you. No report. On October 7th, 2017, Governor Brown signed Assembly Bill 1227 into law, which now requires us to teach human trafficking within our health curriculum. So Orange County Department of Ed had a workshop, a human trafficking workshop, over the break, uh, Thursday, February 22nd, um, from 12 to 3 <coughs> o'clock. So I invited all of the secondary health teachers, hoping that one of them would be willing to give up their time with their family to come to the workshop and then we could go over it with the rest. I'll have you know that all four of them oh, uh, showed up and gave up that time That's with great. their family. So I wanted to give a shout out to Brian Middleton from Corona Del Mar, Kelly DeBus from Costa Mesa High School, Ed Bell from Newport Harbor High School, and Mike Vargas who attended that training. Um, Wonderful. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, That's that is. great. Just wanted to give you an update on the dual immersion programs at the elementary level. Um, uh, last week, Vanessa Gailey and I had an opportunity to go over to Whittier School and visit the Dual Immersion Spanish program and also the College Park Dual Immersion Mandarin program. Uh, we had a combination of being able to really spend some quality time with the principals and talk about what's, what's working within the program and put some uh, plans together for next year. Um, in both of the dual immersion programs, we currently have uh, a kindergarten, a first grade, and a second grade program, and, th and, th and that's uh, growing every year. So we did a lot of planning for third grade for next year, and it was a great opportunity for us to get into the classroom and see the, the great work that the teachers are doing. It's really impressive to see how the program has grown and the refinement that is involved every year with making it better and better. And uh, uh, just another FYI is that yesterday the window opened for families to be able to apply for uh, the dual immersion programs and the modern scholar programs. That window opened up yesterday and it'll be open through April. So we're excited okay. about um, uh, looking at next year and uh, expanding out into third grade with all of the three programs I mentioned, the Mandarin program, the Spanish, and the uh, program at Adams, the Modern Scholars. The Modern Scholars is still limited to the Adams attendance area, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, um, we, we have had uh, some families that uh, have been a part of it outside of it who have put in for transfers, but primarily it serves the Adams attendance okay. area. Okay, I'd like to uh, formally announce that uh, starting tomorrow, we will open our LCAP survey. Ooh. And we <laughs> I know, pretty exciting. Uh, but I, I do want to say that uh, we work very hard to create a, uh, a survey that is uh, very user-friendly, that uh, garners the uh, information and the feedback that we need from our school uh, school staff, parents, and students, and it even open to students uh, grades uh, seven through twelve, uh, and it will be obviously available in English and Spanish, 
and uh, it will be open for three weeks, so starting tomorrow until March 21st. So we really want to encourage everybody to uh, participate in that survey because we really value that data in our LCAP process. Well, we have John Drake here. You want to talk about John Drake? That's what I was going to ask. Who's going to talk about John Drake? Over there in the back, uh, right in the back over there. <laughs> that right. individual Greatest back there who, who deserves Greatest gift you could give him is let him go home. For, yeah, no. for being recognized in Ed Voice. Hey. Yeah, Ed Voice. Yeah, congratulations. <clears throat> so this is a, um, we're kind of gearing up into the exciting time of year for um, me, my favorite stuff going on, as Ms. Yelsey talked about with the Special Olympics events that we have coming up. I do have to share with you, you may not be able to see it from there, but this is me and this is Tim Shriver, the chair of the National International ooh, Special ooh. Olympics. So we had the opportunity to hear him speak um, two weeks ago at a conference in Anaheim and he, it was very powerful. I posted it on Facebook and I'm like, I'm such a, you know, like I don't post like celebrities. I'm like, this is me and Tim Shriver, you know? <laughs> and and um, so it's, it's very exciting. Special Olympics is very near and dear to my heart. And then last week I was up in Sacramento on the advisory commission for special ed and we had a presentation from Special Ed or from Special Olympics about the Unified Sports Program, and as you know, Corona Del Mar um, it participates in that program, and they've asked me to come out and meet with those teachers and look at how we can expand that uh, program within the district as well. And and um, even from the at that meeting, they were talking about some of the good stuff we're doing here in Orange County, and in particular in our district. So. Um, Coming up in May, we're going to have our kind of uh, standing uh, young athletes and then our, our newest soccer program. And then one of our favorite events of the year is going to be our Community Advisory Commission, um, you know, our Exceptional Educator T, which we have, and that's going to be June 13th. We settled on a theme this year. Last year, I don't know if you remember, we did Take Me Out to the Ball Game, mm -hmm. and it so was cute. fabulous. Um, this year, it's going to be, um, it's Dr. Seuss inspired, and it's about all the places you'll go and some of the other things. So I'm excited to see how that all gets, um, the vision gets implemented into that. So uh, we'll make sure you all get invitations to that. And now is the time for people to nominate um, uh, people that they would like us to honor and recognize. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody have anything else they want to say? No? Move to adjourn. adjourn. Okay. <laughs> Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you.